Vou começar. É, hello, saudações a todos, greetings everyone. Welcome to the 60th Fortaleza Outdoor Spring School. My name is Salita Tavares, and the name of the organization committee, I salute you all. First, I'd like to inform that there is a real-time translation. To have access to this, you have to go to the below part of your screen, click on the image of a globe called interpretation, and choose the language, okay? Uh, there is Portuguese or English. Uh, this service was made impossible thanks to the assistance of our partner Air Center, the Atlantic International Research Center. All comments and questions can be made in the chat box of YouTube and on the question and answer Zoom, uh, box from Zoom. Okay? To our opening ceremony, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Professor Regina Celia from the Pro Rectorate of Research and Graduate Students of USC. Professor Lidiana Pinheiro, Director of the Institute of Marine Sciences, eh, Labomar. Professor Caroline Feitosa, Coordinator of our Postgraduate Program in Tropical Marine Sciences. And also Professor Luiz Moutinho from our partner, eh, Air Center. This year, the 60th Fortaleza Alpha Spring School has as its theme, eh, Tidal Sea. How do the rising tides influence life in the tropics? Which is a team that was chosen to talk about ecosystems that play vital roles in maintaining biodiversity and providing essential services for our society and for our biosphere. Mangroves, sandy beaches, seagrass meadows, south marshes, and reefs are some of those ecosystems which are one of the, which has, né, each one of them has unique factors as well as a plethora of goods and services worth, worth giving a closer look, uh, such as being highly productive uh, and also blue carbon sinks. Nowadays, they are all threatened by different stressors related to global climate change and also to human impact. Factors that sum up to the ecological drivers that have sharpened them for centuries. In this strict balance between life and death, Enduring and vanishing, they can provide nature-based solutions <laughs> to help us deal with the socio-ecological crisis that we are facing nowadays. The school is free and universal, and we will approach this team with lectures, debates, and practical courses with some of the <laughs> best specialists of those ecosystems. In the event, uh, this event is organized by the postgraduate program in tropical marine sciences from West State together with the Institute of Marine Science, uh, also from USC, from Brazil, and in, uh, with the assistance of the Atlantic International Research Center at Center. In addition, this event has the collaboration of all the postgraduate programs uh, in USC and also in other places in Brazil. Now I'd like to hand over to Professor Caroline Feitosa, who is the coordinator of the postgraduate program in tropical marine science. Bom dia a todos. É com muita satisfação que os recebemos na sexta edição do Fortaleza Austral Spring School, evento internacional realizado pelo nosso programa, Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciências Marinhas Tropicais. A primeira Spring School ocorreu em 2018, e tem sido fundamental para ampliar e consolidar as ações de internacionalização do nosso programa, favorecendo assim o intercâmbio de conhecimento de docentes e discentes. Desde então, temáticas extremamente relevantes e atuais vêm sendo abordadas ao longo desses, desses anos, tais como mudanças climáticas, a década dos oceanos, biodiversidade, conservação marinha, ecossistemas marinhos, e os impactos antropogênicos, os impactos ambientais e manejo. Diversos pesquisadores do Canadá, Chile, Espanha, Estados Unidos, França, Holanda, Itália, Irlanda, México, Noruega, Portugal e Turquia já contribuíram com o evento, participando, seja de atividades presenciais ou no formato híbrido, remotamente. Quanto à audiência, 
já ocorreu de, em uma única edição, é, contarmos com, com participantes de 65 nacionalidades né, que assistiram às conferências transmitidas em tempo real no canal do Labomar. Então, vale ressaltar o apoio também de alguns programas de pós-graduação da Universidade Federal do Ceará, como o Programa da Geografia, da Engenharia de Pesca, do Direito e da Geologia. Eles contribuíram para o sucesso e estabelecimento da PESCO. Além desses programas de pós-graduação, nossa escola também já contou com o apoio da FUSEME, da Fundação Cearense de Meteorologia e Recursos Hídricos do Ceará, e anualmente é amparada pela CAPES, no nosso, da Coordenação de Aperfeiçoamento de Pessoal de Nível Superior, e pelo programa CAPES Print. Especificamente nesta edição, que é a primeira né, sobre a minha gestão, gostaria de agradecer o apoio fundamental da, da comissão organizadora, especifica, especificamente no nome da, da representante, né, da Thalita Tavares, pois sem essa, sem essa comissão não teria sido possível realizar o evento. Muita dedicação. E, por fim, desejo que vocês aproveitem ao máximo e que saiam daqui com ideias inspiradoras, que auxiliem na gestão dos nossos oceanos e zonas costeiras em prol das futuras gerações. Aproveitem o evento. Bom dia a todos. Bom dia. Thanks, professor Carolina Feitosa. Now, I'd like to introduce professor Liliana Pinheiro. And the, the floor is yours. Bom dia. Saudações a todos. Bom dia. É, em nome do Instituto de Ciências do Mar, LABOMAR, da Universidade Federal do Ceará, eu desejo boas-vindas e uma Spring School é, com muito êxito. Né? Nesse momento, eu gostaria de agradecer a parceria do Ecentro, nosso colega José Luiz Moutinho, um parceiro... Né, das ações de, para conectar né, todos aqueles que estudam, né, que se dedicam aos oceanos, é, agradecer toda a presença dos nossos palestrantes, e é um momento muito importante, né, o Labomar completa esse ano 63 anos de criação, né, de fundação, é um instituto que vem contribuindo né, com as ciências do mar no país e também nessa conexão global. Quando se fala na década dos oceanos, fortalecer eventos como este, né, graças à parceria com parceiros muito potentes como o E-Center, é, é fundamental para criarmos essa, essa conectividade tão necessária em prol do desenvolvimento sustentável, da economia, do crescimento azul né, e de tudo o que precisamos a partir de, um, de uma parceria, de, uma, de discutir diversas ações e problemas no âmbito global, né, buscar soluções é, em prol da conservação e uso sustentável dos nossos oceanos. Uhum. E essa mesa, ela traz é, vocês, né, tra traz esse, é, 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 todo esse público global para discutir a questão dos ambientes, o né, tema desse evento, né, a importância das marés, dos ambientes, é, é, tropicais dentro dessa pauta. É, gostaria de agradecer a nossa comissão organizadora, em nome da doutora Thalita Tavares, pela, pela excelente programação, e desejar a todos e a todas um, um excelente evento, uma excelente escola. Obrigada. É, obrigada. Thank you, professor Lidiana. And now I'd like to uh, give floor to Professor Regina Telha from the Pro Rectorate of Research and uh, Graduation Studies. Thank you, Professor Regina, for being here. Obrigada, Thalita. É, bom dia a todos. Em nome da UFC, eu gostaria de dar as boas-vindas a todos que participam desse evento. Ah, gostaria de cumprimentar a mesa, né, cumprimentar a doutora a professora doutora Lidriana Pinheiro, diretora do Lago Mar, a professora doutora Carolina Feitosa, coordenadora do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Ciências Marinhas, ao professor doutor Luiz Moutinho e à comissão organizadora, em nome da professora Thalita Tavares. É, 
e a todos aqui que estão juntos né, na discussão de um momento, de um assunto tão relevante para a humanidade. A importância dessa escola que discute é, os oceanos e sua biodiversidade é, é muito relevante nesse momento de mudanças climáticas. Né? Então, vocês estudarem esse meio ambiente e como essa mudança climática está... Desculpem, gente. É afetando o ecossistema é de extrema importância. E sendo um evento internacional onde todos podem contribuir, creio que será de grande relevância para toda a humanidade, né? Porque se cada um fizer a sua parte, nós poderemos ter o oceano como fonte de vida, como fonte de bens e como fonte de serviços. Então, eu creio que para o programa de pós-graduação, esse evento que já está no sexto, deve ter contribuído fortemente né, para que esse programa chegasse ao nível de excelência que tem na CAPES, com nota 6 na última avaliação, e quem sabe na próxima conseguir ir para a nota máxima da CAPES, que seria 7, que é o que mais desejamos a todos os nossos programas da UFC. Então, é, eu espero Espero que seja um momento profícuo de aprendizagem, de discussão dos problemas abordados em busca de soluções que preservem todo o ecossistema marinho. Então, eu desejo a todos um ótimo evento e que vocês saiam daqui com novas ideias para manter o nosso meio ambiente. Então, tudo de bom a todos. Obrigada. Obrigada, professora Regina. Thank you uh, for your collaboration, for being here in our opening ceremony. Now I'd like to pass uh, to the handover to uh, José Moutinho, our partner from uh, Air Center. We made all this session uh, possible. Thank you. Uh, and also thank you to Catarina and the backup team. Uh, now, please, the floor is yours. Uh. Thank you so much. I will speak in Portuguese. I'm longing to speak Portuguese. I've been speaking English for such a long time now. Então, é, bom dia. É, obrigado a todos. É, é um prazer estar aqui né, mais uma vez na abertura de, uma, de um evento juntamente com o Labomar, o Universidade Federal do, de, do Ceará. É, tem sido sempre espetacular essa relação e se torna ainda mais relevante ultimamente porque essa ideia da colaboração num contexto é, global é muito importante. E é, só para comentar, é, eu hoje estou aqui em, em Barbados para uma reunião que trata... Um dos temas é exatamente essa questão, né? da questão da erosão marinha, da gestão costeira, do impacto do, do aumento do nível dos oceanos na vida das pessoas... Então, eu tenho certeza que esse evento vai dar muito resultado, como foi das outras vezes, e eu não tenho mais o que falar. Obrigado, obrigado a Catarina. Catarina, liga a câmera, por favor. Aparece, Catarina, que montou tudo, ela é a força que está aqui por detrás. Né? Então, bom, eu passo a palavra e desejo a todos um fantástico evento. Abraço. Obrigada. Uh, obrigada, thank you the, to the Air Center that made uh, this, all these events, these online events happen with uh, simultaneous translation as well. Uh, thank you to all the, the our invitors here, uh, Professor Caroline, Professor Lidiana, Professor Regina, Moutinho. And now I can declare that the 60th Fortaleza Outdoor Spring School is open. I really hope you have five days of excellent knowledge exchange and that and how our all our other speakers said that we can make something better from the all this knowledge, right? And for you to know before I pass the word to Professor Druji that will conduct the opening lecture, we have uh, 
participantes from Portugal, Alemanha, Cabo Verde, Nigéria, Itália, São Tomé e Príncipe, México, Índia, Marrocos, Libéria, Austrália, Gana, Quênia, Colômbia, Países Baixos, Camarões, Noruega e Iêmen. Então, uh, so we, we, we reach uh, many continents with this spring school. Okay, so now, please, Professor Drudi, uh, the floor is yours. And welcome also to Professor Yara, who gently agreed to do our opening lecture. Bom dia a todos. É um prazer muito grande participar da abertura dessa sexta escola de primavera de Fortaleza. Eu vou falar em português para não dar muito trabalho para a nossa tradutora. É, e um prazer muito grande também apresentar a nossa primeira palestrante que vai abrir a, a nossa escola, a professora Yara Sheita Novelli, que, como eu, também nasceu no Rio de Janeiro, é bacharel em História Natural pela Universidade do Brasil, hoje o FRJ, é mestre em Oceanografia Biológica e doutora em Ciências pela Universidade de São Paulo, é professora titular e professora sênior do Instituto Oceanográfico da USP, é fundadora do Instituto Bioma do Brasil, membro do Comitê Nacional de Áreas Úmidas, membro do Grupo de Especialistas em Manguezais e Sobrevivência de Espécies do IUCN, observadora técnica do Comitê Científico da ANSAR e coordenou o Núcleo de Informação Técnica e Documentação e Pesquisa Ambiental da Secretaria do Estado de São Paulo. E, entretanto, o mais importante, eu vou roubar um minuto do seu tempo, Yara, é, pessoalmente, para mim, é um prazer muito grande, uma honra muito grande, apresentar a professora Yara Schiff. É, ela foi a pessoa que me apresentou aos manguezais pela primeira vez, num curso na década de 80, onde eu fiz e ela ministrou um belíssimo curso sobre ecologia de manguezais. Né? É, de lá para cá, nós trabalhamos juntos, escrevemos alguns artigos juntos, gostaria de ter escrito mais, é, com ela, e esse ano eu tive uma surpresa extremamente agradável e eu fui, fiquei muito lisonjeado de ser homenageado junto com a professora Yara no Congresso, no sexto Congresso é, de Gerenciamento de Mangues e Macrobentos na Colômbia. É, é um prazer enorme apresentar a professora Yara e eu gostaria também de parabenizar todos que estão assistindo essa conferência, porque vocês vão ter uma oportunidade única de ter uma conferência com a pessoa que hoje é a principal cientista de ecossistemas wetlands marinhos no Brasil. Então, professor Yara, como professor aqui do Labomar, eu gostaria de agradecer muitíssimo a sua presença, agradecer a coordenação da escola de me ter dado essa oportunidade desse depoimento pessoal, uma pessoa que foi e é tão importante na ciência do país. Professor Yara, muito obrigado. Muito bom dia, Drude. Suas palavras me remetem ao nosso curso de 1978. Foi em 1978 que nós organizamos um curso no Instituto Oceanográfico por ocasião daqueles simpósios de oceanografia biológica Tivemos um curso com o professor Sintron, à época. Drude, você está ouvindo? Agora você está ouvindo. Beleza, ótimo. Então, eu quero agradecer ao convite que me deixou assim... Nossa, vou falar na casa do Drude. Então, é, é, mexe com a gente. Eu gostaria de, de dar os meus agradecimentos à senhora reitora Regina Célia, a Thalita Tavares, organizadora da comissão organizadora, a Lidriana Pinheiro, muito competente, diretora do, do Labomar, ao Moutinho, colega de várias apresentações, 
nas mídias à distância e mais próximas, a Caroline da pós-graduação da CPG do Labomar e, Drude, vamos estar juntos agora nessa uma hora e eu vou botar aqui um, um medidor de tempo, que é o um medidor de tempo de cozinha, é uma joaninha, uma ladybug. É, mas se você, Drude, quiser dar um, um aviso ou alguém uns cinco minutos antes do tempo terminar, porque na hora a gente fica entusiasmado falando e não olha a Joaninha. Então, eu vou aqui começar a nossa apresentação. Vou... Oh. Espero que esteja projetando bem a nossa, a nossa apresentação. E eu, pelo título do, do, da escola da primavera, que aí é sempre verão, até aqui em São Paulo está um verão danado, e eu vejo a Caroline com o ventilador bem em cima para refrescar o cabelo voando, eu também estou com o ventilador em cima. São Paulo está 30 graus a essa hora, coisa absurda. Bom, as nossas marés uh, subindo, crescendo, o nível médio relativo do mar uh, já em progressão, nos trazem ou nos remetem a olhar os as áreas úmidas, e nesse caso as áreas úmidas, principalmente costeiras, tropicais, como há um, um processo bastante interessante. Vocês me deram um título bastante provocativo, que é a conservação das áreas úmidas no Brasil, os desafios e as necessidades. Estou encantada com esse título, foi difícil para fazer tudo caber dentro de uma hora, e eu já gastei um monte de tempo. Então, o que, é que são áreas úmidas? Áreas úmidas elas estão dentro, é, embebidas, é, fazem parte de uma complexidade de processos e ciclos de água. Água doce, salgada, salobra, estado líquido ou estado sólido. Águas em processos complexos podem formar, são re responsáveis, por, por isso que a gente chama de áreas úmidas. Uma caracterização de Brasil em termos dos terrenos altos e os terrenos mais baixos em termos de altitude, cotas altimétricas. E nós podemos ver com grande sensibilidade que a toda a bacia amazônica, a, a nossa bacia do, do Pantanal, uma exceção lá para o Rio Grande do Sul, a planície gaúcha, e toda a nossa zona costeira estão situados em terras baixas, com exceção aqui no extremo sul, do sudeste sul, quando a, a Serra do Mar, esse cristalino pré-cambriano, se aproxima, deixando uma faixa costeira bastante estreita. Temos aqui um mapa com as principais bacias hidrográficas do Brasil e as áreas, unidades de conservação é, mapeadas aqui para o nosso continente. Unidades de conservação das várias categorias, de acordo com a lei de, do ano de 2000 das unidades de conservação, das UCs brasileiras. Temos vários processos e ciclos que regem essa distribuição das águas. Nós temos a água mais líquida, então nós temos água no estado sólido, estado líquido, e aqui nós estamos falando da, até da, do vapor da água, do, dos processos de evaporação das águas no hemisfério central, equatorial, na área mais tropical, as correntes de ventos alísios que distribuem esses, vapor, esses vapores de água sobre a grande massa a amazônica, evapotranspiração das árvores, dessa que compõe essa floresta, e a distribuição 
dessa grande massa conhecida como os rios voadores. Esse é um outro grande processo de distribuição das águas, dos processos de umidade, água, que envolvem nos seus ciclos toda a formação e a regulação das áreas úmidas. Aqui uma forma bastante pictórica de todas as unidades de conservação que se transformaram em sítios Ramsar, a Convenção de Ramsar, de 1971, que trabalha com áreas úmidas de importância internacional, a princípio pelas aves, depois com os peixes, e hoje em dia nós talvez possamos dizer pelo complexo humano que está dependente dessas grandes áreas úmidas. E o Brasil tem, então, essa lista aqui na, na faixa eh, do Atlântico, com exceção desses três compartimentos que não são uh, sítios Ramsar uh, costeiros, mas se integram nos sítios Ramsar do território uh, continentais. Nós temos 27 sítios Ramsar, 24 deles correspondentes às unidades de conserva a unidades de conservação e três grandes sítios Ramsar regionais que já são formados por vários tipos de áreas úmidas, como formando complexos, efetivamente complexos, de áreas úmidas de importância internacional. Aqui nós temos uma listagem das áreas úmidas de importância internacional na, nas áreas costeiras e marinhas, começando aos uh, 30 minutos norte, com o parcel Manuel Luiz, que é um uh, par, uh, uh, recife de coral, e nós temos, então, vários, uh, esses 11 sítios Ramsar ao longo do litoral brasileiro. Temos o que é a área úmida no contexto da Convenção de Ramsar. Não vou ficar aqui lendo, porque todos nós já temos alguma ideia Recifes de coral, uh, marismas, manguezais, uh, essas áreas intertidais, uh, recifes de vários tipos, tanto de macroalgas como de corais hermatípicos, nós temos alagados costeiros, salinos, salobros e até as, as praias, costas rochosas, então, uh, uh, ilhas barreira, todos estão dentro da classificação de áreas úmidas no contexto da Convenção de Ramsar. Me preocupei também em dar um enfoque um pouco maior para os temas que serão abordados nos, nas quatro atividades práticas eleitas pela pós-graduação do Labomar dentro do programa de Austral, de Primavera Austral, olha aí, Primavera Austral. Então, são manguezais, praias arenosas, recifes e marismas. Esses quatro grupos vão aparecer, às vezes, com mais destaque, incluindo estuários, como um grande foco que eu procurei dar nessa nossa conversa. Para termos essa ideia geral, desses processos e desses ciclos que envolvem e caracterizam as nossas áreas úmidas costeiras tropicais, é importante passar em revista as características físicas da nossa zona costeira. Em primeiro lugar, grande é, as, são as massas d'água das correntes marinhas que banham o nosso litoral do extremo norte do Oiapoque até o extremo sul do território brasileiro, lá no Chuí. Temos a corrente norte do Brasil, a corrente do Brasil, e lá para o fim, a zona de eh, convergência intertropical da corrente do Brasil com a corrente das Malvinas. Temos também de um outro olhar, se eu olho do oceano, para o continente brasileiro, é possível 
delimitar três grandes ecossistemas marinhos. São domínios marinhos, que são os Large Marine Ecosystems, que temos, então, o, a plataforma norte do Brasil, a plataforma este, este su, uh, sudeste do Brasil e a plataforma sul do Brasil. São esses três grandes domínios marinhos que, quando se olha do mar para a terra, nós temos essas grandes subdivisões, macro subdivisões do nosso litoral. Todo esse conjunto de correntes de maré, correntes de superfície, grandes domínios costeiros, tudo isso faz parte desse processo. É uma grande conectividade de processos e ciclos que envolvem as águas e as nossas áreas úmidas, costeiras, tropicais. Dei aqui um outro conjunto de eh, características físicas bastante importantes para reconhecer como é, funciona, qual é o funcionamento dos ecossistemas ao longo do litoral brasileiro. Primeiro, em termos geológicos, em termos das marés, que temos desde marés como nove metros e meio, duas vezes por dia, no extremo norte do Brasil, lá em, no litoral do Amapá, mesomarés de quatro a dois metros e micromarés em grande parte do litoral brasileiro. A distribuição da pluviometria, da chuva, a quantidade de água doce que chega a essa zona costeira, às vezes bastante regular durante todo o ano, como no sudeste e sul, e às vezes com estações muito marcadas, como no extremo norte do Brasil. Três, quatro meses de chuva e depois meses de muita seca. São ciclos, são processos. E variáveis das amplitudes térmicas em cada uma dessas faixas. E nós vamos ver que as menores amplitudes térmicas estão mais próximas ao Equador, e grandes amplitudes térmicas a partir da região sudeste. Uma outra característica importante, aquele mesmo mapa com as principais bacias hidrográficas e as unidades de conservação, mostrando que no norte e nordeste temos rios curtos, pouco longo, pouco extensos. E na costa nordeste, sudeste e sul, os rios já são um pouquinho mais extensos, com exceção. Grandes rios que desembocam na costa, Amazonas, Parnaíba, São Francisco, Rio Doce e Paraíba do Sul. Esses quatro rios chamam a atenção na formação dos seus estuários onde encontramos associados várias das áreas úmidas que vamos, estamos nos referindo hoje. Algo bastante importante, eu agora sou professora, e vou dizer, eu preciso conectar desde as bacias hidrográficas até as zonas costeiro-marinhas e oceânicas para ter uma, uma foto, para ter uma noção dessa conectividade tudo que acontece nas bacias hidrográficas se reflete nas massas marinhas e costeiras do, do nosso Atlântico Ocidental. E tudo que acontece na zona costeira também influencia as terras mais altas junto da costa. Então, os domínios pelágico, bentônicos, neríticos, oceânicos, costeiros e as bacias hidrográficas, está tudo interligado, tudo conectado, processos. A importância dessas áreas úmidas costeiras, bom, isso daqui é como chover no molhado, a gente pode falar direto, né? biodiversidade, filtros biológicos, serviços ecossistêmicos, a proteção contra algumas... Das, dos processos que caracterizam as mudanças climáticas. E, hoje em dia, a grande é, estrela da vez é esse tal de carbono azul, 
sempre aconteceu, mas não tinha esse nome. Talvez não era tão famoso, mas ele ficou com, na, na, com as luzes em cima, o, car, a, o sequestro e a fixação de carbono, que nada mais é do que voltar ao nosso velho uh, sistema né, da fotossíntese. Fotossíntese, produtores primários, carbono azul. Tá aí, demos a volta. As áreas úmidas costeiras brasileiras, nessa tabela é, da, do, da Blue Initiative, da, da Ministério do Meio Ambiente e da Mangrove Alliance, então temos as áreas úmidas e as porcentagens de áreas protegidas relativas a cada uma dessas áreas úmidas costeiro marinhas brasileiras. Vemos que, em termos de porcentagem de proteção, os manguezais registram alta porcentagem. Não quer dizer que estejam totalmente protegidos, porém, há a intenção de proteção desses ecossistemas, como estuários, como os manguezais, como marismas, recifes costeiros, olha aí, gente, costas rochosas, todos os ecossistemas marinhos brasileiros. O carbono azul, eu vou, vou dar algumas figuras que são bastante conhecidas da maioria de vocês, como, como é que é que faz, acontece o tal do sequestro e a, o, a tal da fixação desse carbono. O sequestro pela fotossíntese, não, nos, pelos produtores primários, que são vários os ecossistemas que assim procedem, e o sequestro do carbono no solo, nas estruturas, estru, na, na matéria orgânica construída por, pelo, pelos produtores primários vegetais e a, acumulam no sedimento. Em vários deles, há o acúmulo subterrâneo de carbono chega a superar o, a, o, a parte aérea desses vegetais. Mais uma figura mostrando aqui à direita a relação dos estuários como grandes é, produtores de, de carbono azul, o, onde o, todo esse ciclo é bastante intenso, comparado com marismas costeiras, a plataforma continental, as gramas marinhas, os pastos marinhos e os manguezais. Isso é revisão uh, da, da aula 101. Uma outra característica importante desses produtores primários de carbono azul, eles, produzem, eles sintetizam matéria orgânica, exportam matéria orgânica particulada ou dissolvida, vai para as águas costeiras, toda a circulação, por que eu falei das correntes marinhas costeiras, dos grandes domínios marinhos, large marine ecosystems, tudo isso está conectado. Por que a gente tem aula de oceanografia física? Os EDs, toda aquela circulação, vai levando essa matéria orgânica dissolvida e particulada usam dessas balsas marinhas de uh, larvas e algumas espécies adultas que fazem esse transporte me mais mecânico e fazem com que toda essa circulação marinho-costeira leve essas partículas, esses nutrientes para a zona costeira. Aí está... Isso é áreas úmidas, vamos chegar por que proteger e como, quais as necessidades. Os nossos desafios estão aí, como vamos manter tudo isso funcionando? Olha lá, o esqueminha da bacia hidrográfica, pura, angelical, mas aí chega na realidade, uma bacia hidrográfica com todas as, as ações antrópicas que ocorrem ao longo dessa desse conjunto de cursos d'água. Os cursos d'água estão intimamente relacionados com as atividades em suas margens. Às vezes não tão próximas, às vezes 
um pouco mais distantes, atividades agrícolas, barragens, reservatórios, uh, a uso de água para irrigação, mineração, agora nós temos garimpo bem, uh, uh, indústrias, uh, usinas purificadoras, e temos também processos que uh, refinam petróleo. Vamos nós! Aqui um exemplo de, de, desse tipo de alteração. Esse é o rio Paraguaçu, um dos rios importantes na costa central do, do estado da Bahia, onde o Paraguaçu desemboca na Baía de Iguape, que chega à Baía de Todos os Santos. Olha aí, temos a barragem de pedra do cavalo da década de 80 e já em seguida a, acharam muito interessante esse acúmulo de água do Paraguaçu e instalaram lá também uma usina hidrelétrica. O que, que acontece? Esse Paraguaçu tem um estuário e que é a, Bahia, é a reserva extrativista de Bahia de Iguape. Olha aí, já estamos interferindo o nosso modelito de bacia hidrográfica angelical e pura, já está nos trazendo problemas e desafios. Aqui está em vermelho a, a, o perímetro da reserva extrativista da Baía de Iguape, sendo alimentada pelo rio Paraguaçu, pelas águas, já agora não tão... Uh, uh, com um fluxo bastante reduzido devido à barragem de pedra do cavalo e à usina hidrelétrica de pedra do cavalo. Tudo isso atuando e o que chega de água doce para misturar, para fazer o estuário tô com todo o gradiente de salinidade e sustentar as, as uh, atividades do, do do core, do motivo mais importante de ter essa área ser, ter sido uh, uh, identificada como uma reserva extrativista marinha, onde ficou tudo isso? Bahia de Todos os Santos recebe muito menos água doce da, do rio Paraguaçu. Vejam as atividades prioritárias desenvolvidas por todos aqueles usuários, são usuários, que dependem dessa reserva extrativista e marinha, e olha as influências da redução da entrada de água doce interferindo nos ciclos de vida de todos os organismos que são a fonte subsidiária de energia, de alimento, de recursos, de... É, para que eles possam trocar escambo desse material coletado dentro da reserva extrativista marinha com outros recursos que eles necessitam para é, o, a manutenção dos ciclos de vida dessas comunidades que são indígenas, são é, pessoas, que, grupos quilombolas, pescadores, marisqueiras, catadores de caranguejo, eu conheço intimamente essa região e me, me dá uma dor muito grande no coração, me aperta quando eu vejo o descaso dos coordenadores, dos tomadores de decisão para com toda essa gente, essa boa gente lá do estuário do Paraguaçu. Hoje em dia, com a barragem com a usina hidrelétrica, só uma hora por dia há uh, despejo de água doce para alimentar e o estuário de, da Baía do Iguape e a Resex da, da Baía do Iguape. Um próximo exemplo, o nosso uh, Chico, o velho Chico, o Rio da Integração Nacional, com 2.700 quilômetros, aqui saiu o metro, 2.700 quilômetros de extensão, área de drenagem, 640 mil quilômetros quadrados, ocupa 8% do território nacional com atividades. 
mineração, irrigação, hidroelétricas, barragens e muitos quetais, contribuindo para a nossa bacia hidrográfica do São Francisco, com metais pesados, fluxos intermitentes de água, sedimentos sendo retidos por cada barragem, erosão, etc., etc. Um exemplo do estuário do Rio São Francisco. Ele limita, é, a, é, a, é o limite entre os estados de Alagoa, Alagoas ao norte, Sergipe, ao sul, nós temos aí o exemplo do que ocorre na, na margem de Alagoas, dunas de areia se formando e cobrindo todo o manguezal que está por trás desse limite uh, da zona costeira, da margem norte do Rio São Francisco, que é a margem esquerda. E do lado do Sergipe, a margem direita, nós temos um processo de erosão muito, muito forte. Esse farol, que é bem conhecido, já está a quase um quilômetro de distância da costa, ele está totalmente dentro d'água, não funcionando mais como aquele que indicava que você está adentrando a barra do rio São Francisco. Forte erosão dentro dessa margem, Uh, direita do Rio São Francisco. E aqui eu vou dizer para vocês, eles dizem que isso é o estuário, é o estuário desse rio. Eu fiz hoje de manhã cedo, botei as estrelinhas, aí ao longo do rio. Isso vocês podem imaginar, vocês conhecem, vocês estão aí no Ceará, esse é o rio Pirangi, que está aí, gente, cheio de Uh, carcino, uh, 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 shrimp farming de fazendas de criação de camarão de espécie <risos> espécie exótica então temos espécies exóticas sendo cultivadas nisso daqui que a gente chama de estuário do rio Pirangi mas não fica só aí o estuário do rio Pirangi também está sendo premiado pelas, usina, pelas uh, usinas eólicas que estão e das salinas. Então, nós temos salinas, temos uh, piscinas de criação de camarão em cativeiro, temos eólicas, e além de todas as atividades de turismo na zona costeira. O que, que nós temos que nos preocupar? Nós temos que nos preocupar exatamente com todas essas atividades que estão sendo desenvolvidas para e passo na nossa uh, zona costeira, que estão afetando aquela lista enorme de áreas úmidas, que vocês vão acompanhar e vão lidar com todos os mapeamentos, as extensões, as áreas anteriores, e as áreas de agora, a, o que está sendo retirado uh, por utilização, por usos uh, antrópicos, quer dizer, o que, que caracteriza o nosso antropoceno? Estamos nos esbarrando com várias atitudes e ações que comprometem a conservação dessas nossas áreas úmidas, costeiras, tropicais, ao longo do litoral brasileiro. Não paramos por aí com as nossas atividades que podem impactar e que impactam a nossa área costeira. Atividades que causam poluição. Poluição que vai, pelos cursos d'água, chegar às nossas áreas úmidas costeiras. Então, pulverização, esgoto com pouquíssimo tratamento, áreas de criação de gado, onde já não existe mais aquela mata ripária de proteção, de como uma área de tombamento seria, protegendo os cursos do, da, dos rios, petróleo, lixo, usinas, gente... É uma infinidade. Isso tudo ainda eu posso acrescentar 
fogo, machadinha, facão, como chama de delimitação, arame farpado, delimitando áreas que são públicas, são áreas de preservação permanente, são áreas da União e que passam a ser excluídas de todo, ficando o, o bônus para quem passa o arame farpado e o ônus para quem ficou do outro lado da cerca. Os grandes dutos de petróleo, e aqui eu trago um exemplo que nós convivemos já bastante intimamente há 40 anos. Então, aqui nós temos essa tabela do Gundlach e do Hayes, é uma tabela de 1978, que continua atual. São as áreas costeiras de maior embate das ondas, de maior energia, e as áreas costeiras protegidas. E aqui nós temos vários dos nossos ídolos, que são essas áreas úmidas costeiras, com os seus graus de vulnerabilidade à chegada de petróleo nesses ecossistemas costeiros. Então, petróleo chegando nessas áreas de baixa energia causam problemas sérios durante muito tempo, anos, décadas. E aqui é o nosso exemplo muito próximo, um grande derramamento de óleo que ocorreu na Baixada Santista, no canal da Bertioga, num dos dutos da Petrobras, no dia 13 de outubro de 1983. Primeiro caso a ter uma ação civil pública pelo impacto ambiental por óleo que vazou por nove horas de um duto da Petrobras. À época, eu fui a primeira perita judicial de uma ação civil pública por dano ambiental no Brasil. Perita judicial da primeira ação civil pública por dano ambiental no Brasil. 13 de outubro de 1983. Aqui vocês vejam algumas ilustra... fotos cedidas pela CETESB de, de São Paulo, da Secretaria do Meio Ambiente, que fotografaram tanto marismas como os manguezais impactados à época. Posso dizer para vocês que depois de amanhã vou a esta área ver 40 anos depois como está o manguezal. Aos 30 anos, vocês podem ver nas, nas fotos que estão na parte de baixo desse slide, o óleo que ainda saía quando enfiávamos o, o testemunhador a um metro de profundidade, atingindo com o testemunhador, o óleo brotava ainda. Estivemos lá em 2013, 2015, e agora vamos lá em 2023. O grupo está bem menor, porque eu acho que eu, que eu fiquei mais velha. Então, eu, o meu grupo continua sendo formado por alunos, ex-alunos, uh, pessoal envolvido com avaliação de impacto ambiental, e depois de amanhã vai meu genro. Então, meu genro vai também amanhã para essa nossa missão no manguezal do Rio Iriri. O manguezal se recompôs muito, muito, com uma perda grande de área basal, muito mais de 40% de perda de área basal. Era um bosque de mangue vermelho luxurioso. Hoje em dia ficou um, um bosque bem, parece um paliteiro só de lagunculária e já está cedendo para o seu espaço para uma área que é um, uma invasão da Mata Atlântica para dentro do manguezal. Os eventos extremos também devem ser considerados nessa nossa avaliação, que não é somente da subida das marés, né? não é só o, tide, o, o spring tide e as, o, o avanço do nível médio relativo do mar, 
temos alguns eventos que vêm associados com toda essa complexidade de processos atmosféricos, terrestres e marinhos. Está tudo interligado. E aqui alguns exemplos. Então, nós temos aqui, eu até coloquei aqui, superior eh, esquerdo, essa maré eh, meteorológica que aconteceu no sábado, lá em Laguna, litoral sul de Santa Catarina. E aqui é o esquema de como é essa explosão rápida dessa subida dessas ondas, que é um tsunami meteorológico que foi registrado no último sábado, principalmente no litoral sul de Santa Catarina. Enchentes, o aumento térmico, essas amplitudes térmicas que nós estamos convivendo hoje, ontem, amanhã, os incêndios, a, a elevação do nível do mar e as áreas de manguezal que já estão com seus cenários marcando por onde essa água do mar vai invadir esses manguezais e se eles não tiverem uma retroterra que facilite a sua expansão e, e também compatível com o timing. Se a invasão de água uh, do mar é muito rápida, vai provocar erosão e não vai dar tempo do manguezal se expandir para a retroterra sobre as áreas de apicum, que já foram pristinamente manguezais. Então, o manguezal vai para trás, para frente, e ele, no momento, tem que ir para trás. Aí chega naquela áreazinha que eu marquei, que o, o cristalino, a Serra do Mar, chega bem próxima ao litoral, planície costeira muito estreita, o manguezal não vai subir a escarpa da Serra do Mar. Não dá. Então, nós vamos enfrentar problemas graves nessa área de planícies costeiras estreitas. Os grandes... Uh, opa! Isso. Uh, o problema da seca, o problema dos catarinas, desses ciclones extratropicais que se estão se manifestando principalmente entre os 20 e os 30 graus sul de latitude no Brasil, grandes alterações atmosféricas têm sido registradas com cada vez mais maior frequência de recorrência e maior frequência dos eventos. Tudo isso está acontecendo junto. Extinção de espécies estão ocorrendo e o que representa esse nosso jovem aqui? Jovem, talvez jovem há mais tempo, está dando um problema social, problema de, 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 de falta de esperança, falta de expectativa, intranquilidade emocional dos que estão coabitando as nossos terrenos, a parte social está sendo afetada tremendamente por todo esse complexo de fenômenos que causam insegurança, instabilidade emocional. E deixei aqui para esse cantinho inferior esquerdo os nossos tomadores de decisão. Eles estão numa sala com ar-condicionado, Muitos deles em Brasília, zona costeira, estuário que a gente não identifica mais onde está o rio, uh, hidrelétrica que evita que a água doce chegue numa reserva extrativista marinha. Olha que estão eles, bem bonitinhos. Bom, esse daqui é, é o terror, né? É, aquela, é a sala do dia 30 de outubro, que é, só, tem, só tem monstros, coisas que vão nos assustando. Porém, muita gente, como o Drude, o grupo do, do Labomar, vários outros grupos de universidades também aqui do Brasil estão se preocupando. Nós já estamos aqui trabalhando, um trabalho publicado em 2019, sobre... O, os rios atmosféricos que nascem 
de processos cíclicos na Amazônia, na parte equatorial do continente da América do Sul, e como estão se refletindo na zona costeira entre os 20 graus de latitude sul e os 30 graus de latitude sul, onde se encontram os limites latitudinais ou limite austral dos manguezais no litoral brasileiro é, em contato com o Atlântico Ocidental. A conservação, que são os needs, o que, é que nós precisamos? Precisamos usar as ferramentas que já estão disponíveis para nós. Olha o que tem disponível, gente. Há muito tempo. É preciso usar, chamar aquele grupinho ali que está no quadradinho esquerdo, inferior do mapa, tomadores de decisão. Só eles? Não, nós também. Nós estamos fazendo a nossa parte. E aí estamos. Qual é o oceano que nós queremos? Qual é o futuro que eu quero, que você quer? Queremos algo bonito? Já tivemos isso, por que não mais? Para isso temos já aquele grupo de objetivos de desenvolvimento sustentável que sob a égide da Unesco, sob a égide da ONU, Estamos aí, gente, 17 Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável, o 14, o 14 é íntimo, acho que a gente dorme com o 14, o ODS 14 embaixo do travesseiro. Aí está a vida na água, água doce, salobra, água salgada, olha a nossa vida aí, gente, das bacias hidrográficas, para a zona costeira e oceânica. Temos essa fonte de, de consulta, que são os protocolos para monitoramento de hábitats bentônicos, publicado, é um, um e-book, pode baixar, não paga nada, é 2015, e eu separei aqui os capítulos que vão poder ser bastante úteis para o curso de vocês, agora, nesses depois de amanhã, que começam esses cursos, os quatro cursos, manguezal, marisma, ecossistemas de recifes coralinos, praias arenosas e toda essa dinâmica costeira de áreas úmidas. Gente, olha aí a década do, do, do oceano, não é dos oceanos, é do oceano, buscando um desenvolvimento sustentável, temos toda a regrinha, todos os guias, está tudo ensinado. Isso a gente pode até voltar lá para 1992, com toda aquela lista de capítulos, como 17, priorizando ações dos mares e dos oceanos. Agenda 21. A agenda 21 é válida, é válida está viva, restauração dos ecossistemas. Gente, isso foi brilhante, a década da, do, do oceano com a década da restauração dos ecossistemas. Vai identificando a área oceânica que precisa, que não está bem, pega a década da restauração, para não chegar em 2030 e dizer, olha, a lista da, da, dos ecossistemas oceânicos que estão mal, Uh, e aí, trabalhasse a, a, a década da restauração está junto, é ali, ó, tudo junto e misturado. Temos um plano nacional de implementação da década da ciência oceânica para o desenvolvimento sustentável, escrito em português, pode ser acessado pelo Google, pela internet, por sei lá o quê, o que vocês quiserem, ah, e o Plano Nacional de Implementação é para andar para frente. Temos o Plano de Ação Nacional dos Manguezais. É um resumo? É um resumo. Ele foi prejudicado, todo esse PAN Manguezal, que foi de 2015 a 2020, terrivelmente prejudicado. Tivemos um, um apagão governamental 
que nos deixou frustrados. Frustração é o que não faltou nesse último quadriênio. Mas o Pan Manguezal, a gente conseguiu dar um jeitinho nele. Então, são ações inovativas que chamam a atenção para diferentes procedimentos para conservação ao longo de áreas piloto que foram eleitas de manguezal, nesse caso, no litoral brasileiro. Estamos em uh, in, in progress, estamos uh, finalizando sob a orientação, a coordenação do professor Wolfgang Jung e da Kátia, do INAL, do Instituto Nacional de Áreas Úmidas, que fica na Federal de Mato Grosso, lá em Cuiabá, um grande inventário das áreas úmidas brasileiras e uma revisão, uma atualização da classificação hierárquica das áreas úmidas. Eu estou responsável pela parte costeira marinha. O professor Jung e a Kátia Nunes estão, são os responsáveis pela parte terrestre continental. Da trabalho. Estamos trabalhando, já está quase, quase para sair. Nós já temos aqui a atualização de uma classificação hierárquica que o Drude contribuiu fortemente. O Drude foi, dessa primeira, a primeira classificação foi publicada em 2013, 2014, 2015, publicada em português, publicada em inglês, adotada aquela primeira classificação de Jung et al., adotada pelo Ministério do Meio Ambiente, pelo Comitê Nacional de Zonas Úmidas, outro que sofreu com... Não foi a pandemia, não. Foi uma histeria que deu lá no, 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 no Planalto Central. O Comitê Nacional de Zonas Úmidas vem com soluços, e no momento ele está hipnotizado. Vejam, aqui nós estamos chegando no meu final. Como é a tarefa para cumprir com as necessidades que as áreas úmidas, no total do nosso Brasil, e no nosso caso da zona costeiro marinha, devem ser tratadas. A gestão tem que ser sustentável. Para uma gestão sustentável, tem que ter a participação social, tem que ter o uso das ciências marinhas, do conhecimento científico, e tem que ter o espírito de uma boa governança ambiental. Isso daqui é a receita. Olha aqui no cantinho superior esquerdo, os, os ODS. Na área costeiro marinha não é só o 14, não. Temos vários outros. A parte social, saúde pública, a parte que mexe mais com geologia, a parte de recursos naturais, tudo isso está aqui. Fazer bom uso dos ODS. Tem 17, dá para usar muitos. E ter a, o comprometimento e a boa vontade de traduzir os nossos ROS, sigmas e tetas para a parte para angariar, para ganhar a participação social. Esse é um dos motivos que eu pedi para fazer a apresentação em português. Eu queria falar com os brasileiros, com os brasileiros que devem estar fazendo o curso, com os brasileiros que estão nos ouvindo, com os lusófonos dos países de língua portuguesa que nos ouvem, e há aqueles cuja tradução simultânea fez com que nos ouvissem. Eu falei para todos, falo para todos, precisamos botar mão na massa, precisamos trabalhar e continuar construindo, nada é ganho. Gente, eu posso dizer para vocês, estou com 80 anos, fiz 80 anos esse ano, estou mais viva do que nunca. Tive dengue, foi ruim para burro, 
tive enterrar nada, tudo isso, mas eu continuo botando meu tijolinho. Depois de amanhã eu vou para o manguezal. E vocês vão estar junto comigo. Vamos estar todos juntos. Por isso, Drude, lembram da gente, quando, como lá em Cartagena, esse ano do MMM6. Estamos juntos, continuamos trabalhando. Não nos assustamos, assustamos com os anos de vida. É experiência. Isso é experiência. Graças a Deus, e eu digo graças à vida, a vida nos dá energia. Obrigada. Bom, obrigada, professor Yara. Excelente palestra, principalmente eh, para os nossos estudantes do, do Brasil todo e dos outros 13 ou 15 países que estão nos assistindo. E eu vou agora abrir para perguntas e comentários, lembrando que ainda temos alguns seis ou sete minutos. É, aqui diz dez. Para esse tipo. É, <risos> dez minutos, a gente pode ir um pouquinho mais. Então, queria agradecer novamente a palestra da professora Yara, bem-vinda aqui ao a Escola de Primavera, e vamos ver se nos encontramos. Né? Então, certeza. gente, eu vou passar os trabalhos para a Thalita, que vai organizar então, as perguntas e comentários dos participantes. Muito obrigado. Depois eu volto para finalizar. Obrigada, Drude. Então, é, obrigada, professor Drude. É, nós tivemos uma pergunta aqui no chat do professor Lebo Tem, Tem Ra, não sei se eu falei correto. Né? Ele perguntou é, qual a estratégia de inovação para a sustentabilidade do mundo, né? a sustentabilidade terrestre. É uma pergunta, assim, na verdade, bem ampla, né? É... Não sei, eu acho que é mais uma questão talvez discutir um pouquinho, né? Talvez sobre o nosso papel aqui como cientistas, talvez com base no nosso conhecimento, que tipo de propostas inovadoras nós podemos trazer, né? Para sustentabilidade, durabilidade, né? Do, do, da da biosfera, vou dizer assim, né? Eu, eu iria talvez por esse caminho. É, eu, Talita, obrigada. Eu não, não, não ouvi bem o nome de, de quem formulou, mas a pergunta é muito pertinente. E me permite dizer uma coisa. Do jeito que nós estamos vindo, nos mantendo como se nós soubéssemos tudo, a academia sabe. A academia não precisa falar para os outros, porque a academia sabe. Esse jeito não está funcionando mais. Falar complicado também, não, pelo jeito, não funcionou mantermos uma sociedade dentro de uma campânula que cientista fala com cientista, que não vai perder saliva falando com, com quem é da, da periferia da ciência. Não funcionou. Nós temos que envolver a sociedade, envolver o conhecimento empírico. O conhecimento empírico nos ensina muito, Aliás, às vezes, mais do que um bom livro. Então, eu gostaria também de, de que o Drude entrasse nessa roda de conversa, onde nós precisamos expandir os nossos perímetros. Ainda essa semana saiu um artigo interessante na revista da FAPESP, onde uma grande especialista, uma ela não é astronauta, ela é uma bióloga astrofísica, onde ela diz que a ciência tem que chegar na padaria e nos botiquins. A, 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 a linguagem nossa é que tem que mudar para chegarmos a sermos roda de conversa nas padarias e nos botiquins, que se, tenhamos é, conhecimento é, que traduza e ganhe essa gente da padaria e do botiquim para se aliar a nós. Nós precisamos de aliados. Essa é uma luta que não vai terminar tão... É um processo contínuo. 
processos não param, aí é que está. Tem que conectar e que o processo siga ganhando mais aliados que entendam por que, que nós temos objetivos tão incríveis. Nós estamos, na realidade, olhando para trás, olhando para corrigir a nossa esteira, o que deixamos para trás. Drude, você. Não, só para rapidamente, né? não quero pegar o teu espaço, mas a questão da inovação, é, a gente, temos um exemplo muito importante, que é na, na bioquímica e na indústria farmacêutica, que em determinado momento percebeu que a etnografia e as tradições das populações tradicionais são fundamentais para o desenvolvimento de medicamento. Hoje, qualquer grande indústria farmacêutica tem um departamento que trata só de etnobotânica, etnofarmacologia. A gente tem que fazer alguma coisa. Essa é uma inovação significativa, como transformar e levar para uma solução de problemas ambientais atuais a experiência empírica e tradição, às vezes até somente oral, de povos tradicionais. Né? Quem trabalha em manguezal sabe muito bem do que eu estou falando, já que a maior parte dos ODS relativos a manguezais são cumpridos por essas populações há muitos séculos. Né? Então, eu acho que isso é uma inovação significativa, que não é só restrita à nossa área, não. Em várias áreas a gente não consegue fazer esse gap. Né? E no caso particular do Brasil, eu acho que tem uma, uma frase da professora Helena Nader, que é presidente da Academia Brasileira de Ciência, é que o, talvez o grande objetivo da ciência brasileira é ela começar a ter a cara da sociedade brasileira. Ela não tem a cara da sociedade brasileira, Isso. é só você olhar a cara das pessoas que estão nessa tela no momento. né? Então, eu não queria me estender muito, deixar a Yara, que realmente é, é uma oportunidade de escutá-la. E tem outras perguntas interessantes. Tem uma pergunta aqui sobre a importância do, do Ransar, das áreas do Ransar para o Brasil. É, me preocupa muito a questão do Conselho Nacional de Áreas Úmidas, que eu participei também, e não tem nem mais notícia, né? porque, como a Yara falou, são soluços. Então, você nem sabe se existe ainda, se você é membro, se não é membro. Eu agora estou tendo a oportunidade de estar no Conselho Deliberativo, tanto do Fundo Nacional do Meio Ambiente quanto no Fundo Clima, e uma das coisas talvez seja que esses fundos mais específicos, e os conselhos mais específicos, como de áreas úmidas, tem algum tipo de aporte dos fundos. Talvez seja a solução para a gente amenizar esses soluços políticos que a gente vem, infelizmente, testemunhando. Tá bom? Eu bom, gostaria... então, cara, é... Rançar. Não, eu vou só dar um complemento. Aqui, eu, faz duas semanas, nós tivemos o Global Mang sendo realizado uma semana completa em Maragogipe. Mar, Maragogipe, eu digo que é o recôncavo do recôncavo baiano. É uhum. aquela porção uh, que faz parte da reserva extrativista marinha lá de, da Baía de Iguape. Tivemos uma mesa redonda, um, medo, redonda, uma mesa, uma mesa uh, que só composta pela gestora da Resex Marinha de Iguape, por pescadores, por uh, quilombola, por pessoal diretamente envolvido com a vida daquela Resex. Gente, eu fiquei impressionada com a, a, a desconexão entre o, o povo, as, a comunidade natural as atividades em torno e dentro dessa Resex Marinha com os dirigentes, com os tomadores de decisão, estão em, em esferas totalmente diferentes. A Bahia está em outra. O governo da Bahia está numa e a Resex de Marinha de Bahia de Guap está em outra. É, usina hidrelétrica, a barragem de pedra do cavalo, são seres, coisas que chegam lá e estão lá. Então, o funcionamento, como se dá o funcionamento de todo esse sistema, não existe a mínima preocupação. Agora, me, eu senti tanto o que eu aprendi Nessa uma semana lá em Maragogipe, é a minha volta, eu já estive lá, 93, 96, 90 e 
dois mil e alguma coisa, aquilo é, eu tenho uma parte minha que fica em Maragogipe, meus amigos. Mas deixa eu ir para o Ramsar. Ramsar é uma entidade, veja, foi assinada essa convenção em 1971, um ano antes da Convenção de Estocolmo. Vejam, antiguidade não é que é posto, antiguidade é ação. A, a leitura dos ornitólogos à época da proposta da Convenção de Ramsar era proteger as aves migratórias. A Ramsar foi evoluindo, foi evoluindo. Eu tive a oportunidade, eu fui, uh, representei a região neotropical de 1999 a 2002, junto à Secretaria da Convenção de Ramsar. Então, co co consegui entender um pouco mais da filosofia da convenção. É uma das poucas, se não a única, convenção que não diz assim, você vai estar tá fora, não, você não vai ter direito a mais nada. Não, 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 é, não, uh, não prega a retirada dos humanos das áreas úmidas. Os humanos que estão nas áreas úmidas de importância para Ramsar, eles são importantes que sejam mantidos ali. São eles os nossos fiscais naturais. Aquelas áreas úmidas de importância internacional no século XXI continuam de importância porque lá estão os humanos, lá estão as comunidades, são os guardiões daquelas áreas. Então, Ramsar tem, filosoficamente, uma uh, linha, uma política de conservação. Não é preservação, não é o um intocável, é conservação com códigos de ética, manutenção das características ecológicas. Isso é ética. Isso é ética. A conservação de qualquer processo viso, vivo exige ética. Ética tem toda a base de todas as religiões monoteístas, politeístas, o que é seja, todas primam pela ética. Todas. É, a minha visão de Ramsar é essa. Ela prima pela conservação, ela prima pelo engajamento de todos com a filosofia da conservação. Opa, obrigada, professora. É, como a gente já está entrando no tempo de intervalo, eu vou é, fazer mais uma pergunta aqui do, do Geraldo. Ai, a ah, Pode passar, fala aqui. Não, só rapidinho, né? Isso aqui está ótimo, porque a gente está encontrando pessoas que não vê há um bom tempo. Geraldo, um grande abraço. Tem algumas décadas que a gente não se vê. Geraldo Ezin, que a gente teve uma experiência grande né, na, na FATESP, há muitos anos atrás, na FATESP, desculpe, na Agência Ambiental, na CETESB. CETESB. É, na CETESB. E agora faz uma pergunta muito importante, que é o que nós estamos discutindo que é como internacionalizar ou integralizar no governo a questão dos manguezais. E a gente está vendo aí o exemplo do Comitê Nacional das Áreas Úmidas. Infelizmente, não foi só nesse. Todos os comitês acabaram soluçando durante seis anos. E nada garante que não vá soluçar novamente. né? Então, talvez essa questão de uma... Não uma pulverização, mas uma maior participação e integração nas sociedades locais talvez seja a solução de criar um buffer. Essa é a minha opinião, mas eu gostaria de escutar a Yara sobre isso. Olha, eu, eu tenho a sensação que eu luto por isso desde que eu me entendo por uh, alguém que tinha voz. Uh, e quando a minha voz não chega em determinados ambientes, eu busco aquele que possa me representar. Lembro com muita saudade positiva, saudade uh, boa, do, quando o Fábio Feldman era deputado federal. Ele ligava para nós, não tinha internet, essas coisas, ligava lá para o I.O. e dizia, professora, preciso de um texto curto e grosso para defender aqui tal e tal questão. Eu pegava a minha turma do laboratório e dizia, gente, 
temos trabalho, temos dois dias, que era o tempo de pedido de vistas do Fábio Feldman. Ele pediu vistas, a gente tem que mandar rápido material para ele. E eu passa... nós passávamos com um bom grado, porque ele tinha acesso a uma outra, um outro público-alvo. Temos que usar os nossos canais, não pegar o, o, o X, que era o Twitter, ou pegar o, o. fazer bom uso dos canais que nós temos, fazer bom uso dos nossos alunos de graduação fazer bom uso dos profissionais dos programas de pós-graduação. É um nível acima já, é gente que já tem influência sobre outras áreas. Mas eu vejo que, em muitos casos, são os alunos da graduação que têm o papo no, no CD, como é, CA, DA, lá, quando eles vão tomar as biritinhas, cervejinha, eles têm o papo e eles dizem, eu vi na tal aula isso, isso, isso. Olha, vamos nos inscrever para ir junto no tal trabalho de campo. É isso que nosso trabalho faz. Eu me formei em dezembro de 65 na atual UFRJ, que era a época a Universidade do Brasil. E eu sempre acreditei nisso. Tinha Norma Crude, Maciel. Norma Crude foi grande, grande batalhadora. Foi ela que sabia tudo das leis que incidiam sobre manguezal. A primeira pessoa que fez valoração econômica de um impacto, a, 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 como é que é? A Marra Negra, lá no Rio Grande do Norte, em Galinhos, foi, foi Norma Crude que fez a primeira valoração ambiental de impacto de salina, salina numa área de mangue. É isso. Vamos juntar os nossos pedacinhos. É, muito, muito obrigada, professora. Né? Vocês podem ver que, que, que não tinha uma pessoa talvez melhor para abrir a nossa experiência, ainda mais junto com o professor Drude. Né? Aqui vários elogios no, no chat, né? e são totalmente merecidos aqui na nossa sala também, tá certo? É, o professor Drude, professor Yara, novamente, muito obrigada. Eu faço a palavra para vocês encerrarem, né? Pessoal, a gente vai ter um intervalo até às 10h30. Então, 10h30, todo mundo de volta. Aqui não precisa sair da sala, né? Pode estar conectado, né? Mas a gente retorna às 10h30 para a nossa primeira sessão com o professor Alex, como mediador, o professor Sérgio Rossi e o professor Raymond Duarte. Trude, obrigada. Bom, obrigada a você, Yara. Acho que foi ótimo. É bom, bom você ter lembrado da, da norma, né? A norma e a Dorothy, né? aqueles manguezais da Bahia de Guanabara, eu tenho uma copa de papel até hoje. Eu né? tenho, eu tenho. É, é, claro, claro. Ter trabalhado com elas também foi fantástico, né? desde o início. Bom, com você também. Enfim, vamos, vamos parar por aqui, porque são quase 80, 80 anos, seu, quase 70 mil, a gente vai ficar aqui conversando a tarde toda. Mas, realmente, eu acho que foi ótimo, eu acho que os alunos vão aproveitar muito da, da tua palestra, como eu falei do início, é, é, a expectativa era óbvia que ia se materializar. Vocês tiveram a oportunidade de ter experiência com uma das pessoas, é, não, não é uma questão só de idade, mas da experiência, da capacidade de trabalho, e principalmente, não é um trabalho só feito no computador, mas da vivência da professora Iara nos mangues e em outras áreas costeiras do país todo uma atuação política muito importante nesses comitês todos, tanto nacionais quanto internacionais. De modo que eu queria agradecer pessoalmente agora a tua palestra, a tua presença aqui. Né? Acho que o Labomar e a escola ficam muito lisonjeados de terem tido você aqui. E eu espero que todos tenham aproveitado da mesma maneira que eu. Um grande abraço, Yara. Tchau. Obrigada. Então é isso. Até mais tarde, 10h30, tá, pessoal? 10h30 a.m. we are back. Então, vou sair. Vamos olha aqui, ó. É...
É, pessoal. Ele faz lá. Aí, ele não, só não corre bife, mas negócio de banda. E ele fez a
Okay. Good morning for all and good afternoon for who is in another geographic region. Bom dia para todos. Uh, we are retaking now uh, the sessions of the eighth, sixth spring school. And uh, we thanks for all that stayed in this session and welcome for the new listeners, the section. Uh, we are now opening the session called Ecosystems, Goods and Services. We will have two lectures, Dr. Raymond Ward and Dr. Sergio Rossi. And it's important to stress that any question to lectures uh, can be made through the chat and that the lectures will respond the questions after the second chat, after the second lecture, so. So, uh, to the first lecture, we have Dr. Raymond Ward. Raymond? Hi, Ray. Can you hear me okay? A pleasure to give you with us. Let, let me present you. Uh, Dr. Raymond Ward is graduate in environmental sciences, PhD in environment, both by University of Brighton, England. Ray is professor and researcher of the Queen Mary University of London and of the Estonian University of Life Science, Estonia. Currently, Ray is reader uh, at the Queen Mary University of London, undertaking research of the impact of global change on coastal ecosystems, particularly mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrass drawing of expertise in sediment geochemistry, ecology, and geoinformatics. Again, thank you for you stay with us, Sergio. Welcome to the Sixth Spring School. And now the ball is with you. Excellent. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Excellent. I'm going to just minimize a couple of bits so that I can actually see my <laughs> my presentation. Uh, and hopefully the internet doesn't cut out here. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Alex, and thank you to everyone for inviting me to, uh, to talk. Uh, I'll be talking about ecosystem services, uh, mangroves and salt marshes, uh, and presenting some of the work uh, that I've been doing over the last uh, few years. So let's just start with uh, ecosystem services. What do we kind of mean by this term? So let's break it down. We'll start with uh, ecosystem, uh, biological community of interacting organisms in their physical environment. So when we're thinking about that, I'm not a biologist. I'm kind of an environmental scientist, as Alex said. So for me, I do a lot of work with uh, with ecological uh, kind of studies, but I also work a lot with kind of what's actually happening in the environment. So how are nutrients being cycled? How are the nutrients that are in the system actually affecting what species can survive there and thrive there? OK, is it impacting on, for example, your mangroves or your salt marshes? Uh, how is the, the kind of temperature or the water that's in there, the salinity? How's that impacting on the species that are there? And how does that impact on how they interact with each other? OK, so that's the ecosystem system side. And then when we talk about ecosystem services, that's a, a very selfish kind of thing from a from a human perspective, because they are the contributions of an ecosystem structure and function to human well-being. Basically, why do we care about it as humans? The benefits that we as a society obtain from nature. OK, now we can break those down into kind of provisioning uh, services. So that's when we're talking about kind of crops could be aquaculture, could be agriculture, could be wild plants, tea, honey, etc. timber, you know, from uh, from mangroves, etc. OK, or biomass from energy. Then we've got the regulating services. That's the stuff that I kind of work more on. Uh, so then you're talking about filtration, estuarine filtration. You know, it's locking away, storing contaminants. Yeah, the accumulation of those uh, contaminants, erosion control, 
water flow maintenance how are they protecting your coastlines for example and then there are those more kind of cultural ecosystem services things such as recreation from an educational and scientific value which is really important particularly from a kind of urban mangrove perspective where there, there are kind of local ones and we can introduce uh, our students and the, and the local populace to to, to, to those kind of uh, ecosystems okay now, ecosystem services, they're not, they're not provided in isolation. If you're talking about your, your, your pollination or your, your biodiversity, or you're talking about your pollination and the fodder or the, the, the kind of things that you can take from it from a food perspective, okay? Now, some of those will work synergistically, okay? So one of them will benefit the other, but their pollination and biodiversity. And then some of them, they've got trade-offs. So use one, yeah, you try and uh, restore, for example, a mangrove so that you've got uh, better better kind of uh, biomass or pollination. I'll put pollination there. Yeah, and it decreases the other one. Okay, so it could be uh, carbon storage. You may choose, uh, for example, the, the species that grows most rapidly. But actually, how's that working for biodiversity? It doesn't, doesn't work very well for biodiversity. Okay, so there's a trade-off there. Now, for example, in a in a salt marsh, it could be you've got a decrease in grass biomass. So in some particularly those highly managed uh, salt marshes where you've got a lot of grazing. Yeah. If you're reducing the grass biomass there, you can be increasing the biodiversity. You can be increasing the soil nutrients, it can be increasing the soil carbon, OK, increasing water flow regulation. In other areas where you kind of uh, you've got decrease in biodiversity, decrease in soil nutrients, decrease in soil carbon, you can end up with an increase in grass biomass. It could be something like Phragmites australis, okay, very very high biomass, but when you've got loads of Phragmites, you've probably only got Phragmites, yeah, so uh, common reed, uh, and that will decrease the biodiversity of that area, okay. So and that's really, really important when we're thinking about carbon, soil carbon, OK, that blue carbon that uh, Yara talked about earlier. And that will come up uh, a little bit later on. It will come up in a few of these slides because I do a lot of work with uh, with blue carbon. OK, now, uh, if you've got an area where you've got a lot of uh, uh, pollutants being stored, OK, that's one of the really good uh, ecosystem services that mangroves provide. Yeah, they lock away uh, pollutants and contaminants in the soils and they can lock them away for a very long time. However, it can reach a tipping point whereby you've actually you've got so much contamination in the area that you start to end up with tree die off. OK, this is a picture from a mangrove uh, in Santos in, in Brazil in Sao Paulo. So there, the, the, the contamination was so high that trees started to die off. You can see there's defoliation. Some of the trees have just fallen down. Okay, and in that case, you've got decreased carbon sequestration. Okay, so it's, 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 the carbon's not being locked away in the soils. It's not being locked away in the biomass either. You've got decreased flood and erosion control because the biomass isn't there to slow the, the flow of the water, okay? got decreased nutrient regulation you've got decreased habitat quality the the, the species that utilize mangroves whether it's marine species whether it's avian species or whatever they do they're not able to to utilize that area quite so well as they would with a pristine mangrove okay so you've got uh, a decrease in the, the offering of a range of different uh range of different other ecosystem services okay why do we even care about ecosystem services first off you gain a wider understanding of nature's functions, interactions, and those benefits that they have to society. Mangroves historically, and salt marshes as well, were considered that kind of that muddy area over there that has no value. Now we realize that actually they provide a wide range of benefits to, to us as humans, okay? To sustain health, diversity, and productivity of nature, okay? So that's really, really important to meet the needs of present and future generations. And also to achieve planning solutions that consider all possible outputs, okay? So that you know, if you're trying to improve one particular ecosystem services, are there going to be trade-offs and losses of other ecosystem services or are they working synergistically so you actually end up with a greater benefit from a range of different ecosystem services, which is obviously what we want to aim for, okay? Now, mangroves are really, really important. One of the most productive ecosystems uh, on the planet. It, it's exactly the same for salt marshes. They're very, very, very uh, uh, productive. 
from mangroves pantropical area coverage i know we're kind of focusing on brazil but there's people from from all over the world i saw in uh, in the list and we've got there we've got uh, in africa we've got across north and south america we've got all the way across kind of asia and all the way down to to australia okay so wide range of countries 124 countries and five countries account for for for, for about 50 percent including brazil okay so, like I said, provide a range of provisioning, regulated, supporting and cultural ecosystem services, those things that are important to us. But they're also mangroves and salt marshes are some of the most threatened uh, ecosystems on the planet. Threats from aquaculture, threats from deforestation, threats from urban expansion and also those threats from climate change. OK. And they're varied when we talk. I do a lot of work in Brazil, but I also work in other areas. And they're, they're, they're different. They are different. They kind of work in the same way generally, but species richness varies globally. Forest structure varies globally. Human impacts vary globally. In some areas, it's damming. It's kind of sediment removal. In other areas, it's more kind of aquaculture. Okay, so there's a range of different impacts, and it depends on where you are. OK, legislation is protecting them. Pollution. Are they more urban mangroves? Do they have kind of uh, trace element contamination? Are they affected by oil pollution or are they kind of pristine? Some areas are very, very pristine. The climate change factors that are going to impact on them. The tides. That was something that Yara presented in one of her slides. And I'll, I'll show another one uh, similar to that later on. Oceanic currents, data available, sediment types, huge range of factors that influence our mangroves. And it varies regionally as well as on a site by site basis okay so let's look at this in a bit more detail there's the the, the geary map the, the the classic geary map of the location of uh, of all the different mangroves across, uh, across the world yeah but if you have a look at here that uh, where where are they most species rich so if you have a look at uh, the americas uh, and kind of west africa you can see species diversity is very very low from a mangrove tree species perspective OK, but then you look over into kind of Southeast Asia and that kind of East Asian area. And you can see that biodiversity can be extremely high. Tree species richness can be extremely high, 41 to 47 different tree species in an area. And that can obviously uh, influence functional resilience. So if we think about uh, those kind of uh, those species that uh, kind of actually have a function within the mangrove it could be could be uh, mangrove crabs, for example. OK, it could be nutrient cycling, could be things that affect carbon uh, storage. OK, now, if you've got, say, for example, we'll say South America, you've got one species that full, that's fulfilling that function. Whereas you've got a range of different groups, a range of species and a range of different groups that are performing the same function in say Southeast Asia, that means that you may potentially have greater functional resilience in those areas, okay? Uh, and that will mean that there could be different uh, responses to anthropogenic stresses, whether it's climate change or whether, it, whether it's pollution, okay, depending on where you are. So if you watch this space, myself, Alex, uh, that was just introduced me, Druji and a couple of others, we're working on a paper to, to kind of present uh, how those factors uh, vary, uh, uh, particularly uh, across the kind of that kind of Southeast Asia kind of area and then compared to uh, Atlantic coast and Eastern Pacific. OK, now I said that uh, that mangrove structure can also vary. OK, so you've got this different species richness. I've got a range of different uh, zonations there. It could be Hizophora right down in the front. Or it could be Avicennia, depending on what uh, where you are. OK, but generally here in the, in the Americas, we've got uh, Hizophora, we've got uh, uh, Avicennia, we've got uh, Lagunculari, we've got Aconococcus. OK, so it's just a few species. I said you could have 41 to 47 different species if you're thinking about those mangroves in Southeast Asia. So if you have a look at that bottom kind of uh, bottom right figure there, you've got Sonorati, you've got Avicenia, you've got Hizophora. It could be a range of species of Sonorati as well. Yeah, Brugaria, you've got your uh, Seriops, you've got more different type of Avicenia, you've got your Nipa, wide range of species. And that can influence not... Not, not that functional resilience, but the ecosystem resilience, okay, particularly to things such as uh, storm surges or, or sea level rise, okay, because you've got much more varied uh, uh, species kind of diversity within those, those mangroves there, okay. Human impacts. Now, you can have kind of, uh, sorry, that was 
supposed to be uh, dropping in several pitches there. But you can have subsistence uses. So it could be just minor kind of removal of crabs or it could be much larger kind of impacts, things such as uh, conversion to aquaculture. So that bottom right figure, anything that's in a, a in a kind of a, a fairly linear polygon would be aquaculture. OK, it can be direct removal of mangroves or it could be that there's contaminants coming out of those those aquaculture ponds impacting on the adjacent mangroves. OK, so a range of different factors that can impact uh, on mangroves from aquaculture could be increased uh, agriculture. OK, removal of salt marshes, removal of mangroves. Yeah, conversion to uh, to cropland. That's something very, very common uh, here in Europe, but also in other areas. Or it could be increased urbanization that you can see in the top right. That's uh, a picture from a mangrove here in, uh, in in Fortaleza, where I am at the moment. OK, so a lot of that uh, site has actually been removed. They've uh, they've cut it down. There was a, a shopping mall built on part of it. OK, so so quite large scale kind of losses uh, of the mangrove. So that's direct removal, as well as the fact that in urban mangroves, you can have a large amount of contamination from those urban sources that go into the mangroves and affect their ability to deliver uh, a range of different ecosystem services. OK, that brings me on to pollution. OK. Uh, many mangroves can be highly polluted. There's a picture of uh, Santos in uh, uh, um, uh, in in Sao Paulo. Uh, there is a picture of uh, I guess everyone knows what that is. That's Guanabara Bay in Rio de Janeiro. Okay, now that's that picture that I showed you of mangroves in Santos Bay. It's one of the largest ports uh, in South America, or the largest port in South America. And there's a, the, some of them, they are the most contaminated mangroves that I've studied. I actually ended up with quite a bad rash on my arm digging out my my cores in that site. Okay, Guanabara Bay in uh, in uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Obviously, it's uh, it's one it's a mega city uh, here in Janeiro. So you've got a wide range of contaminants, particularly from urban sources. Okay. Uh, and then you've got other areas where you've got more kind of oil pollutants, yeah, that, that can come from, from oil extraction. Could be from places such as Niger Delta or could be Guanabara Bay, could be uh, areas in Mexico where I've worked as well. Okay, so they can be it, we, mangroves, like I said, they're really good at estuarine filtration. They can lock away those contaminants and they can lock them away for very long time periods. Oh, yeah. But also they can uh, they do get to that tipping point whereby the mangroves actually uh, can't 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 uh, respond very well to those to those contaminants and then they end up dying. OK, exceptional resilience, uh, an important ecosystem service. Now, uh, I've, I've looked at mangroves quite a lot. And uh, at one point I thought, I wonder whether contamination actually impacts on the phenology of mangroves. OK. So uh, I'd already worked out uh, from some sites in uh, in Mexico. So it was 33 sites in uh, Isla de Carmen in Mexico. Uh, so looked at how that that actually how the contamination from the from the city actually impacted uh, on the the mangroves. Okay. So first off, we looked at NDVI. Okay. We looked at the seasonal am amplitude, the length of the season, the maximum greenness. OK, and kind of looked at that and see, OK, this is a standard that we've got for phenology in uh, in these mangroves. Then we looked, OK, I, I picked out three sites because it was much easier. I could have put 33 on there, but it would have looked a bit lost. Site six was the, the most contaminated site. OK, site 32 was the least contaminated site, the most pristine. OK, and site 18 was kind of somewhere in between. Okay, now what you can see there from that figure is maximum greenness is much, much lower in the most contaminated site. Also, in both the contaminated sites, there's a slight delay in the start of season. Yeah, that that, that greenness, the onset of greenness in those mangroves. OK, so what we can see there is actually that's having an ability uh, an impact on the ability of those mangroves to photosynthesize and therefore potentially having a knock on effect on how they can actually store uh, carbon in their biomass okay so there's an impact from pollution on that carbon storage okay so then uh, i've i've done some work in uh, in africa in the niger delta Huge amount of sites that we studied. It's uh, it's one of the areas with the, with the largest uh, reserves of uh, petrochemicals, but also there's a lot of people that are stealing the, the the oil. And what they do is they basically they knock a hole in the pipe, collect the oil, 
And then that ends up with kind of large scale kind of spills across this huge mangrove area in the Niger Delta. Now, uh, from these figures, uh, you can see that SOM, that's uh, soil organic matter. So we measured soil organic matter in, uh, in, in the uh, uh, in the in the sump in the in the mangroves across that kind of 800 sites there. And the FCEC ones there, they're control sites. Yeah. Fringing control, estuarine control. Uh, and they're the ones that were not impacted. So you can see there that in actual fact, there's a substantially lower amount of soil organic carbon in those areas where they're where they're impacted by oil pollution. If you have a look at the bulk density, bulk density massively increases because what you've done is you've basically lost a lot of that soil organic carbon, soil organic matter from the system. And you've ended up with peak collapse so greater bulk density. So in actual fact, that pollution is having an impact on that carbon storage. OK. We then kind of uh, use machine machine learning tools and got an idea. So see if we could actually identify from the from the remotely sensed data where which areas were degraded. And we got very, yeah, very good accuracy there. Uh, Ninety six point six percent. Sorry. I, I heard someone talking. No, no, no. Sorry. OK. okay. Continue. Uh, from a climate change perspective. Well, let's have a look at what the principal impact factors are. I produced a figure because I thought it was good. I put it in a in a paper. OK, so you've got a range of different factors. So you've got increased CO2 can have an impact on plant productivity. Increasing temperature can have an impact on productivity. Could be positive, could be negative. Storminess can have an impact on plant productivity, erosion, sediment supply. Sea level rise can have an impact on plant productivity, can have an impact on sediment supply, can have an impact on mangrove drowning, and can alter salinity, okay? Oceanic currents, that could alter salinity at a larger scale, okay? Alter precipitation regimes, whether it's increased flooding, or increase in drought can have an impact on salinity in the system, mangrove drowning, sediment supply, erosion and plant productivity. And it obviously where those factors are being impacted, they will also have a knock on effect on ecosystem services. OK, from a tidal perspective, uh, you had to produce a very similar figure. You've got those. This is from Brazil. So you've got those areas that are macro tidal, those areas that are meso tidal, those areas that are micro tidal. How does this actually have an impact on, on mangroves? OK, now, if you think about how mangroves will respond to sea level rise, you've got that accommodation space and elevation capital yeah, on the on the inland side. So if you've got sea level rise, they can move inland where there's no kind of barrier. OK, but obviously, if you've got a micro tidal mangrove, a meter rise in sea level will have a much greater impact yeah, from an extent perspective than it would in a micro in a macro tidal site. OK, so tides can actually influence the ability of mangroves to respond to sea level rise. OK, moving on to storminess. OK, what impacts do these have on mangroves? They can remove, they can defoliate, they can break the branches, they can knock down the trees completely or they can produce uh, or drop a load of sediment into the site. Now, in many mangroves, they've been kind of dealing with these uh, these storms for, for for millennia. OK, you can see there's a, a series of storm tracks that's recorded since the 1800s. Now, there are areas where we haven't really seen many storms. OK, so, for example, South America or West Africa, that's one of those areas where they're not commonly storms. However, exactly as Yara said earlier, Santa Catarina has been impacted by a storm. That one there was recorded in 2005. That was the first one recorded in that 200 year time period. Since then, since the, the I produced this figure, there've been two more storms, including one really recently in the last few days, okay? So, we're, uh, and the IPC have suggested that there will be an increase in the frequency and intensity of tropical storms with associated knock-on effects. And where that's likely to occur in areas that have not had that adjustment to that uh, impacting factor, the storm surges, that's going to have an increased impact on the ability of mangroves and salt marshes to respond to these uh, to this impacting factor. Okay, 
Precipitation, that was one of the other factors I mentioned. How does this influence mangroves? Now, I've done a bit of work with uh, in the northeast of Brazil on, on drought, but I've also done some work uh, in Iran on the impacts of drought or, or mangrove ecosystems. So in 1998, uh, in the Middle East, there was a really, really strong drought. OK, so if we have a look at this leaf area index uh, data point, you can see in 1998, there, there was a, a, a strong drought that lasted uh, a, a little over a year. And what that did was it impacted the ability of the mangroves to actually produce those produce those leaves. OK, so there was a knock on effect. It only lasted for about a year or two. OK, but the, the impact that it had on the mangroves went on all the way to 2018. OK, so 20 years onwards. We actually did some climate modeling and found that, yes, the mangroves would recover eventually, but they would never recover to pre-drought conditions. And that's not taking into account climate change. That's just climate modeling based on uh, on standard assumptions. OK, so droughts can have an, uh, a, a massive impact on the ability of mangroves to actually uh, continue to, uh, to to produce leaves and therefore photosynthesize and therefore lock away carbon. OK, uh, salt marshes, as with mangroves, really highly productive ecosystem, global area cover coverage, 44 million hectares. Found pretty much anywhere. If you've, if you've got a coast, you've probably got a, ma a salt marsh, OK? Now, salt marshes, exactly the same as mangroves, pro provide a range of those uh, uh, ecosystem services that I mentioned before and are currently under threat from land reclamation, coast development, dredging, eutrophication, climate change, particularly coastal Swedes. OK, so a wide range of impacting factors similar to those uh, as stated for mangroves. OK, loss rates are about one to two percent per year. Crooks suggested that we've already lost about 50 percent of our salt marshes. OK, now species richness also varies globally in salt marshes uh, as it does with mangroves. OK. Now, I do some work in the Arctic and in the Baltic and species richness there can be very, very high. In the Baltic, you can find, uh, I think after the maximum I found was 38 species per meter squared. OK, so really, really species rich. OK, however, and that's here, this Ward Hotel 2014, really, really species rich, range of different uh, uh, um, uh, zones of uh, uh, of different um, different plant communities. OK, if you look at what you've got in South America, Probably you're likely to find maybe Densiflora, then Spartina alterniflora, and maybe that's it. You may only have those two species or potentially Juncus krausii. OK, so really, really quite different compared to similar to North America. Very, very species poor. OK, now that will obviously have an impact on fun functional resilience in salt marshes as well, as we found, as we've shown for mangroves. OK. Human impacts, marsh drainage is a big thing. This is a salt marsh uh, up in the uh, in the UK. So marsh drainage has been going on for hundreds of years in Europe. OK, so you've got a lot of areas that have been converted to agriculture uh, and were formerly salt marshes, which means that they're not providing the same level of ecosystem services as a salt marsh would. OK, coastal development, a lot a lot of houses are built on uh, on former salt marsh areas. OK, there's an entire city uh, in the south of the UK that was built on a salt marsh. OK, so complete loss of ecosystem services there. OK, historical management. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of agricultural activities that have been undertaken uh, in salt marshes uh, in many areas, particularly up in the, the kind of Baltic. They've been using it for for kind of cutting for 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 crop uh, uh, for the for the for the production for uh, for um, uh, for gardens for uh, for cows uh, and and those kind of species. Okay. Now uh, moving on, so very similar to mangroves, uh, sediment type and availability varies quite strongly in uh, uh, in salt marshes. But it's very, very similar to those of mangroves, particularly those estuarine fringing and back barrier. But also we can we can include kind of apicum or non salt, uh, non tidal salt meadows, particularly those in the Baltic and Arctic. Now, potentially with apicum, it could be salt production. OK, there's a large amount of salt that could be in there. OK, or it could be more aeolian activity. It could be in kind of non tidal areas. It could be actually that you've got inundation from storms or from atmospheric pressure. 
OK, so when you've got those very, very high equinoctial spring tides, if you've also got a very, very low pressure, you're likely to have greater flooding. OK, and that can bring sediment in or it could be ice transport regimes, not so much in the tropics. Though. Storminess. OK, so similar to mangroves, I mentioned about mangroves, but also you can have substantial erosion at the frontal area of salt marshes. That picture there on the left is Hurricane Sandy from the States. Uh, I took that picture from uh, when I was over there. And the other one, Hurricane uh, Winter Storm Gudrun, that was another picture that I took from the Baltic states. In actual fact, that storm deposited 10 centimetres of sediment, which obviously means that that provides a little bit of elevation capital for those uh, for those salt marshes in, in response, uh, helping them to respond to sea level rise. OK. As with mangroves, salinity and inundation are factors that can uh, can influence salt marshes, which means that you've got different, different plant communities that are likely to occur. If you've got very, very brackish areas, maybe you're more likely to have things such as uh, phragmites. If you've got something very, very salty, you're more likely to have things such as salicornia or sarcocornia that you can see in that picture there. And that will influence what kind of species are likely to occur there. OK. And finally, moving on to blue carbon, because I know I'm kind of running out of time. Blue carbon is really, really important. It's one of the largest uh, stores uh, of carbon, and it's one of those that can be stored for very, very long time periods. It can be millennia. OK, now climate change mitigation from that perspective, 55 percent of our atmospheric carbon is taken up at sea. OK, so a massive amount of that carbon is locked away in our in our oceans. And of that. 50 to 71 percent of that is stored in those vegetated blue carbon areas. That's our mangroves. That's our salt marshes. That's our sea grasses. OK, and they only cover less than 0.5 percent of our seabed. So a tiny, tiny area providing an outsized amount of uh, provision of that ecosystem service. OK, what that means is they're really, really important for carbon storage. But it also means that a very small area where it's impacted, degraded or lost, yeah, is is likely to actually go from being a carbon store to a carbon source. OK, a release of carbon. OK, so that means that we should really, really be focusing on protecting our coastal uh, vegetated coastal ecosystems. OK, they're important from a blue carbon perspective because, for example, you've got your seagrass there. That's locking away a lot of carbon itself, but it's also a donor source for the adjacent mangroves. It can be a donor source for the adjacent salt marshes, OK, because it's locking away a lot of uh, carbon in that biotic pool. OK, but you've also got terrestrial sources that are providing uh, carbon to our coastal and marine ecosystems. OK, so it could be vegetative material, could be dissolved organic carbon that can actually be exported to our coastline. Yes, yeah, so our terrestrial sources are providing a donor of carbon that can be locked away in those coastal and marine ecosystems. Could be things such as uh, filamentous green algae. Yeah, a lot of that, although a large proportion of that, remember, will be broken down fairly rapidly and re-released as CO2 and methane. But some of it will be locked away, particularly in our salt marshes and our mangroves. Anyone who's been to a salt marsh or a mangrove will probably see a little bit of that filamentous green algae on the on the surface uh, of the sediments. Could be from macroalgae. Yeah, could be from uh, those kind of uh, calcareous uh, red algae, OK, uh, which you have here in uh, in the tropics. And we also have uh, uh, outside of the tropics as well. It could be from the salt marshes themselves or so those coastal ecosystems or mangroves. I could have put mangroves in that picture. OK, so a wide range of donor sources. OK, now there you can see if we compare to tropical forest, tropical forest, everyone talks about tropical forests. There's a great store of carbon and they are. But remember, those long term so uh, stores of carbon are generally in the soils. OK, seagrasses have a lot of carbon locked away in their soils, salt marshes even more. And then you look at the mangroves and they they are locking away a huge amount of carbon for a very long time period. It can be millennia. OK, estuarine mangroves or oceanic mangroves, as well as what's locked away uh, in the biomass itself. OK, whether it's above ground or below ground biomass. OK. Now, 
there are some areas that are relatively understudied. OK, so I've done some work uh, here up in uh, in the northeast of Brazil in Rio Pacochi, Rio Cogó in, and Rio Sierra. OK, and you can see they put the carbon sequestration rates and how they change over time. So that's soil organic carbon. Now, just to put their kind of a mean value on it, Hill Paco Chi, 890 to uh, 1,553 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. So it's locking away that amount of carbon per meter squared per year. OK, that's a lot of carbon. Let's put that into perspective. Global estimates of mangrove carbon sequestration are between 134 and 226 grams per meter squared per year of carbon. OK, now in these semi-arid mangroves up in the northeast of Brazil, they're actually got an outsized uh, uh, level of ecosystem service provision that they're providing. Actually, a lot greater in many instances than other kind of global mangrove areas. OK, let's move on to another piece of work. This is uh, the, the other ones uh, in review. This one's in review as well. This is some work that I've done uh, in the Amazon estuary. Uh, and this is from a range of different uh, sites in uh, Ilha de Marajó in the north of Brazil. So uh, what I've done is I've looked at um, how much carbon stored there. And if you have a look at those values, they are even greater than those that we've recorded in the north east of Brazil. OK, because you've got massive sources, you've got a huge amount of carbon that's being exported from the river. But adjacent to that. You've also got one of the largest mangroves in the world, yeah, just just to the to the east of uh, of that area. So you've got a large amount of donor source in the immediate area. Okay, now this is first study that's actually been undertaken in this area, and what that's showing is that certain areas are really undervalued for their study. Okay, and if we actually start to to study in those areas, particularly kind of south southern hemisphere and also in South America then what we're doing is we're actually altering those global averages because in some areas we found that carbon storage or carbon sequestration is much, much higher than in many other areas of the world. OK, this is uh, just a final slide piece of work that I've, uh, I've just published with a range of different researchers from all over the world. This is on salt marshes. And you can see that this is this is carbon sequestration throughout the world taken from uh, or a range of different published studies. This was a big kind of literature research that we we undertook. And you can see that Southern Hemisphere is massively underrepresented and tropical salt marshes are massively underrepresented okay, in the literature. So that's something that kind of needs to be uh, addressed moving forwards. Uh, and that's my final slide. So thank you to everyone for listening. And I think there'll be uh, time for some uh, for some questions uh, later on. Okay, wonderful uh, lecture, Professor Raymond. Thank you to be with us again, and uh, a very enlightening uh, lecture. Uh, remembering for all that the questions to the lecturers will be made after the next presentation. Uh, now, uh, in, in this section, I, will, uh, I got the pleasure to present Dr. Sergio Rossi, our next lecture, to whom we thank in advance. Muito obrigado, Sergio, por estar con nós. Sempre um orgulho ter você junto conosco. Uh, Dr. Rossi is graduate and PhD in biology by the Universitat of Barcelona. He specializes in marine natural resources zoology and biological oceanography, with focus in climate change effects on benthic populations, marine vertebrate distribution, ecology and physiology, benthic pelagic footprint processes, and marine wildlife conservation. Professor Sergio holds a vast experience in field work and experimental design, as well as coastal monitoring programs. Currently, Dr. Rossi worked with marine biodiversity and global change, focusing on the role of environmental and biological factors in distribution and health of benthic organisms. Thank you, Sergio, again for you being with us and uh, in the Six Spring School. And now the world is with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will share 
my screen now. I think that everything everybody's looking at it. Okay. Okay. Um hello. Let me see if we can. Okay. Um hello everybody. Thank you to, to for, for this uh, spring school. Again, it's a very it's, uh, incredibly nice to participate here, and uh, especially for the both people that have been uh, uh, just working very hard too in this, this last moment, you know, I think that has been ch slightly changed, and uh, we just adapted to the last uh, moment, last minute, uh, uh, you know, moves. Uh, thanks also to, to Talita, especially because, you know, you know with uh, Miss Duarte, they were just uh, <laughs> amazing in the last very moment uh, adaptation of the of the changes uh, today I will talk about um uh, things that are very different they they asked me to talk about the project that we are uh, um, moving on uh basically in Europe in this very moment with this ocean citizen but then I just make a broader approach uh, talking about the uh you know the scientific uh, uh, outreach and the citizen science uh, because I think it's very important as uh, Professor Yara said in the last minutes of her presentation and also in the intervention that she had uh, there's a problem here about the gap of knowledge uh, about the let us say the the, the difficulty to, to transmit the information in a proper way from the scientific staff, the academic staff, the engineering staff and so on and so on to the, uh, to the, the rest of the, of the people not saying that the rest of the people in, in some way are different from scientists, but scientists have and several times the problem to, to just uh, communicate the things in a, in a much more, not only easy way, but much more participative way. It's not easy at all. I've been working in many places, in many areas, and publishing many papers, many scientific papers uh, that uh, sometimes uh, are read. If you are fortunate, by 100, 200, 500 people, even 1,000 people is reading your, your scientific papers. But you understand that uh, there is a problem when you try to uh, communicate the stuff, communicate the things that you are doing. And this is really an important thing that I understood uh, something like 20, more than 20 years ago, now 23 years ago. Uh, because, uh, uh, okay, scientists really has to get involved in the problem at several levels and we have to have the uh, to have the, the tools to do it but we need to have a clear um you know a clear channel to communicate to the people i will give some examples and then i will enter in the citizen science and finally i will try to make you understand how this kind of outreach how this kind of communication how this kind of citizen science may be used also to transform the territory to make a deep transformation of the of the of a territory uh, through not only the science and the technology but also especially to the possibility to transmit this kind of information because well uh, i mean it's too important to avoid the responsibility and even if we have a phd and that's fantastic uh, i'll say here from the jurassic park is uh, the hobson hobson Nobody cares. It's the same thing as a PhD. You have a PhD. Nobody cares. I mean, you are a scientist. You may have uh, something like, uh, um, you know, uh, a deep knowledge of your uh, subject, a deep knowledge of one of the things that you are treating, that deep knowledge of the re your research line. But uh, sometimes uh, it's completely disconnected from reality. This is why. I just became in the 2000, from the 2000 up to now, uh, a part of the scientist, a researcher, a professor in the universities, blah, blah, blah. Also scientific journalist and making many things also at several levels with kids, with people that was uh, just uh, in, so, in many ways prefer to hear what you have to say, but they need the right words. They need, you know, the, the kind of information that is in some way uh, viable to these people because we have a lot of jargon, a lot of things that we uh, decide that were, you know, that are perfect, uh, that are maybe uh, very precise, that that in some way are uh, uh, straightforward. And we understand that, for example, when you say siphonophore or when you say phytoplankton, and we are talking about a tardigrade. Um, Everybody more or less knows how what it is, and of course, it's not. 
uh, many people has not to know it because they are not in some way uh, in the same uh, in the same mood as you as you are, but especially because they are not prepared for several for several kind of jargon. Okay, so look at these examples. Uh, science can be very good to just uh, debunk many things. This is a you know this is something like kind of meme or advertisement or whatever you want, and it's very nice because at the end. Sharks had the most, let us say, lured, the most black, the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, disgusting image in terms of assassination of people all over the world. But look, hippopotamus, for example, the hippos killed 2,900 people every year in Africa, for example. And nobody knows that. And they, they see hippos and they say, okay, hippos, ah, yes, I saw this film do you remember this film, Fantasy 1940? Oh, the hippos were just dancing. And the hippos extremely territorialist and extremely, extremely aggressive. They are. And they kill people and because they are psychopaths, but because they are just defending their own territory and their uh, 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 population, their, uh, their, uh, 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 the, the other uh, parts of the uh, of their population. The same height, horses and so on. And, you know, this makes you that the sensationalist is many times, and I see every single day with the messages that we give to the to the the, the different uh, news that are uh, spreading all around. Climate change is one example. Pollution is another example. But also other things like, for example, nuclear fusion. Sometimes uh, the things related, for example, with uh, uh, artificial intelligence and one so on. Here you have another example. But it's a nice example in this case. It's a positive example also to just highlight the importance of the microalgae in the overall uh, oxygen production in the in the world. And it's just funny, okay? It's just uh, giving you a message that you don't have all, only to think about trees, about shrubs, about about uh, uh, you know grass, but you have also to think about, for example, the oceans and how it works. That's a, that's a real powerful you know thing that. With very simple messages, sometimes you have a huge approach to what I'm thinking uh, is uh, the transmission of science in a simple way. This is, a, uh, for example, this is a, a campaign that was made a few years ago and uh, is extremely powerful because it talks about bottom trolling in the or, in the ocean's bottom, in the ocean's uh, seafloor. And you see, we used I used this image very many times, connected with other images that I have, because I'm just working with bottom trolling also and the, the you know the impacts on the on the uh, communities. And many saying something like, okay, you will have the same vision of the bottom trolling in terms of say that I use the same method to catch, for example, giraffes, to catch, for example, elephants, to catch, for example, news, to catch, for example, zebras, you will have the same image. And in this case, the powerful thing here is transmit the, 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 the sensation that when you are not seeing, when you are not a uh, testimony of what happens, uh, you are not able to really judge what is, what is uh, important or what is not important, okay? The same here, much more uh, brighter, okay, the chemistry on our life. Here you have the different kind of hormones, but this kind of hormones are just uh, uh, related with emoticons. And with this kind of emoticons, you just simply see some of this may be mostly related. Of course, this is much more complex. We all know that it's much more complex than that. But you just give a powerful message about this kind of chemical signals. And look here, I will just show a very brief video, which is for me extremely powerful, which is uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay. And uh, um, let's hear him. Well, it will be also uh, in, the, in the titles, in the, on the, uh, in the video titles, you will see it. This guy that is a, a very powerful divulgator, is a very powerful, uh, is the king, one of the kings of the scientific outreach in the United States. Let us say one extremely very complex, uh, uh, let us say, uh, uh, concept or set of concepts, how easily is driven and it's very easy to understand. Look at this. The most astounding fact you can share others about the universe. 
most astounding, the most astounding fact is the knowledge that the atoms that comprise life on Earth, the atoms that make up the human body, are traceable to the crucibles that cooked deep elements into atoms that all under extreme temperatures and pressures. These things, the high mass ones among them, went unstable in their later years. They collapsed and then exploded, scattering their enriched guts across the galaxy. Guts made of carbon. And all the fundamental ingredients of life itself. These ingredients become part of gas clouds and condense, collapse, form the next generation of solar systems, stars with working planets. And those planets now have the ingredients for life itself. So when I look up at the night sky, and I know that, yes, we are part of this universe, we are in this universe, but perhaps more important than the is that the universe is in us. When I reflect on that fact, I look up. Many people feel small because they're small and the universe is big, but I feel big because my atoms came from those stars. Is it not? So it's very important to understand, you know, that the language, that this kind of, of, of communication is essential. For, for to make understand the people many, many, many of the concepts that for us are very clear and are very, you know, quite straightforward. So let's talk about the other part, which is the citizen science, which is extremely related with that one, with this communication, is a step forward. The citizen science can be designed and can be just reviewed as the step in which the citizens are directly involved in some scientific action. And we will talk we will make uh, uh, just a brief resume about it, okay? About what is citizen science. Citizen science basically is this kinds of uh, science uh, that is uh, just uh, developing project of collection of data or just uh, observations or just uh, uh, even sometimes interviews, uh, sometimes also experiments that can be made by everybody. Uh, citizen science, in, in some way, it's uh, uh, at the end helps the scientists, the same scientists, to just have the possibility to make broader, you know, broader uh, 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 approaches to several problems. Not all can be citizen science, but many, many things have been related with citizen science. And nowadays, this kind of approach in which the scientist teaches. To the people, to the to the to the you know, to the people, to the lawyer, or to the people that is uh, the more uh, people that can be uh, uh, you know uh, 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 constructed a house, and the other that is in the supermarket, whatever. That in their free time they can just give powerful tools, for example, to have a huge vision of what is happening, because because sometimes it's not only the involvement of the people, because we need to transmit information. But it's also involving the people because we need a lot of data and we don't have money. Okay. So the beginning, you know, uh, it's clear that in this kind of citizen science, people, everybody can be involved. For example, with all these apps that are just uh, looking at flowers, looking at the presence of uh, insects, looking, for example, uh, at the presence of some uh, fishes or animals in the in different parts of the of the world, okay, and that can be gathered, that can be processed, and in some way can be used to just improve our knowledge of vast regions that only with scientists it will be very difficult. Everybody can be involved, of course, and they don't need expertise. The people doesn't need expertise; uh, they can. They teach, they can be uh, involved with the scientists. They have to explain a bit what is uh, the purpose of the 
uh, of the experiment, of the observation, of the long time series, of the single, you know, this kind of single follow up of some of the phenomena that are around us. The only thing that is important is there is, in some way, is commitment and curiosity from these people. Okay. Um, in fact, it's very interesting because this kind of approach breach, this is a real breach between the people that normally is not used to make science and the, the scientists in both ways. That's also very important in the way in which they are involved uh, uh, in, a, in a process. Okay, but also the scientists learn what is the main or what are the main things that are, for example, worrying people or what are the main things that are just uh, 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 giving more curiosity to the to the persons that are involved in this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, citizen science, okay? For example, uh, well, uh, it, there was a huge citizen science experiment during decades and in this citizen science, ornithologists, but not professional ornithologists, amateur ornithologists, just were seeing the uh, presence or absence of uh, the different kind of uh, their species in the United States, okay? But also Canada. And they saw the migration between climate change of these species, uh, polar or saltwater. Okay, uh, depending on the needs of the species. And there was a very beautiful work in which the observations of people that was, in this case, not specialists of mythologies knowing everything about birds, but they were amateur persons that loved to, to see birds. And they were gathering all this information in a, in a single, let us say, work in which many universities work together to just uh, 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 have the opportunity to look this kind of movements of the birds. Why it was so important? Because it was completely impossible to do it by their own. The universities had no way, no chance, no budget to do that. And that was a very beautiful and very successful way to just involve people, okay? So there is something here that has to be clarified. When you can do and make this kind of citizen science, you look for the emotion. You look for the, uh, you know, not only to just teach what you have to do, if you have to, for example, to look at the flowers of a place or what you have to make a transect of fishes or whatever. It's just engaging the people and uh, these people has the opportunity not only to look at the science as, you know, a tool that we all have to just improve our society, blah, 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 but also as a tool to uh, enhance curiosity, enhance fantasy, enhance the things that they are uh, just of the scientists. Because scientists, we are uh, all of us, or most of us, hopefully most of us, are curious people and are just engaged to some of uh, the work because they really love it. And they look at the, at, at the universe and they look at the nature, look at the world in a different way. That's very important. And, uh, you know, then the practical part is the Howard accessibility and extensibility is now very common to make this kind of apps in which you, for example, look at the plastic, uh, at the marilita, floating marilita in this case, from a, um, a boat, from a ship, um, even from the beach and so on and so on. Also, there was another app in which you localize Medusa the jellyfish blooms in many parts of the Mediterranean Sea, but also this was extended to Asia, was extended to the United States and North America and other parts of the, of the world. So this kind of, of, of groups are very important. And if they are well-designed, they can give you a lot of information. This information, of course, uh, that has an advantage, has to be in some way treated. That's the main problem of the citizen science, especially when it's not uh, you know, when you don't have the possibility to, let us say, please, let they take, take it like this as, as brackets, to control because you have a small group of persons and then can be caught very easily because you have few people and it's much more easy to, to teach and to, to give them the, the basic information. If you have a huge quantity of people all over Europe, all over the world making the same thing, then you have to treat all this data and all this data is not easy to just uh, pursue or to just uh, reorder, okay? So uh, you have also to be sure 
that all these people is uh, not only engaged, but is sure that the data that they are trying, you know, that they are giving is uh, giving in an anonymous way. This is more and more important. And when you make this kind of citizen science, you have to be sure that ethically everything is okay. It's much more important than you think. It's not only, for example, like the, uh, the, the, like the uh, questionnaires or when you have making an interviews or focus groups or uh, uh, free listing and this kind of things which are much more dedicated to the uh, social economical uh, part of the, of, the, of the work, but also those which are just simply making a citizen science approach. So you have to be sure that uh, the people get comfortable with this kind of, uh, of option, okay? And then authentication of trust, as I say. So the, let, us say, let us say that many of these data is fuzzy data. So nowadays we are very, 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 very lucky because the uh, artificial intelligence is giving us a powerful set of tools to decorate to just filter many of the information and discard this information that is not properly uh, obtained or is um, erroneous or is, uh, you know, maybe is sometimes maybe is not complete. So this kind of things give, uh, give to you that this fuzzy data may be translated to data that can be let us uh, let us uh, uh, put it in this way can be translated in a true scientific paper which is the the main aim of the citizen science because it's, it's not the paper per se of course it's this kind of bridge and this kind of collection of information also for reports or for other kind of approaches but but it's just in many cases it's just a uh, 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 gathering a lot of information that may be so variated that it's difficult to just have it really clear and really objectively quantitative in your, uh, in your portfolio. Okay, let me give you one example that we did uh, some time ago. Some time ago, uh, we just worked with the, uh, coral, the red coral, Okay, and this red coral is a very emblematic species, the Mediterranean Sea, it's a precious coral. And the idea that we had is that because we didn't have money to look at the extension all over Italy in this case, what we did is making a, and, 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 and let us say, uh, 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 this kind of approach with citizen science giving to the people the possibility to describe what they saw in their scuba diving experience. So these people had this kind of, uh, of uh, information, okay, and a questionnaire that was fulfilled. And in this questionnaire, there were some pictures in which you say, okay, uh, in the picture, you see when there is a lot of coral, there is a few coral, or there is no coral. When the coral is present, when the coral is not present, when the coral is damaged, for example, when lines, and so on and so forth. So all this information was just uh, uh, gathered with more than, I think, what there were more than one, 800, something like that, questions for all the Italy, okay? And then, uh, importantly, the questionnaire was divided in several degrees of complexity. This is also very important for the uh, citizen science approach because sometimes it's very simple. It says, okay, there is coral or no, there is no red coral. No, there is no red coral. Fantastic. This is, this is a data that is important because the red coral lives in certain areas and if there is no red coral, maybe many reasons for this, for this, uh, you know, for its presence or absence. But you know that at least it's not present. The second step, again, is, well, is present, but you see it's, it's healthy, it's not healthy, it's much more dense, less dense, has uh, impacts like, for example, with the lines or there's an impact of partial mortalities and so on. And this makes you the possibility to just refine your results. At the end, here you have this kind of table which you have. Uh, did you dive specifically for red coral? Have you be, uh, been informed or, or, uh, on how to avoid breaking colonies, which is much more respect what is the aim of the diver in the area? And then uh, death of the red, uh, red coral colonies, the habitat, estimating branching colonies, and so on and so on. This is from less to more complicated information that this kind of person people give to you. So 
Now, just to, to, to finish a bit, okay, what we are talking about, um, let me present one of the most, <laughs> the, the biggest, let us say, communication, educational, citizen science project that in this very moment is, is making from the oceans in the, in the, in the world, uh, in, in Europe, okay? It's a blue mission, and it's related basically with restoration. It's basically uh, uh, related with restoration because one of the focus points of citizen science is precisely restoration, restoration efforts made in the Caribbean, restoration effort, efforts made in the, uh, in the Indonesia, for example, in the Philippines, of course, in Australia, many other, and in many other parts, in which you bridge the academic uh, people, the, the scientists, and the divers, in this case, or the people that is intended to make this kind of approaches of restoration in these areas. Okay, so in this case, okay, this is the uh, Ocean Citizen Project. The Ocean Citizen Project started uh, this year at the beginning, in January of uh, 2023. And it's a project that is dedicated basically to make a regeneration program in which the awareness of the people, the connection of the people with the oceans, the education, and also, like what I say that, the leisure of the people, you know, the gamification of the activities is very present. Okay, so it's a project in which uh, we try to make many things at the same time with the regeneration, which we basically enhance the connectivity between the ecosystems, just trying to connect different ecosystems, for example, to uh, marine protected areas that are far apart, making in the, in, in the middle, making an active restoration program to just connect the populations of both, uh, of both areas, increase the biodiversity of the area, increasing the organisms that are structured in the system, the ecosystem engineer organisms, like for example, the seaweeds, the seagrasses, the sponges, the corals, the gorgonians, and so on and so on, increase the biomass and the blue carbon. The biomass is the associated biomass, let us say fishes, lobsters, uh, uh, mollusks and so on and so on that can be interesting for fisheries, for example, and the blue carbon, the storage and the mobilization of the carbon in the structures and in the sediments that are uh, uh, around these organisms. Make an active control of the invasive species and also erase the, the invasive species. In this case, what we will see in the Canary Islands is basically in the Adema, which is a sea urchin, and also in the fireworm that is not an invasive species, but nowadays uh, is spreading and is a very uh, is a threat of the of the area because of climate change. Then make a huge climate change and biodiversity monitoring program in which you have this kind of uh, installation. With this, we have this kind of uh, uh, approach in which also the citizen has the opportunity to participate to make things with this kind of approach, uh, uh, looking at data, looking how the data is treated, taking some of the data of the, of the area. Okay, and then, of course, uh, making an environmental education uh, uh, program that is dedicated to the ocean's awareness. Uh, in this program also, it's not directly uh, related with this, but it's uh, with the communication and citizen science, we are also fostering mariculture and local fisheries. So we are just uh, enhancing this kind of uh, local activities because we think, we think that it's very important. The project is uh, based on 22, uh, 23 partners, okay, in which we have uh, uh, people from basically uh, several parts of Europe, um, Spain, there's Italy, Israel, France, Germany, Denmark, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Uh, everybody here is a consortium that has a specific task within the project because the project is divided in basically what is there, what we do have in the area in which we want to, to just uh, make the action. Second is trying to understand which are the environmental or biological factors that drive and permit or not the regeneration. That's very important too. Then a tool in which we try to understand uh, also uh, which are the possibilities of regeneration in the area from the, let's say, uh, engineering and logistic point of view. Then a monitoring program that is accompanied my other two more packages, which are basically the socio-economical one, trying to understand the local needs of the economy and also 
adapting the model to the local people, also, of course, the education part in which we try to make this citizen science, ocean literacy, engagement of the people, stakeholder, uh, the communication programs, and so on and so on, to make, to be sure that the people understand what they are doing. Okay, in this way, I want to just make one bracket here. I want to just say that these kind of programs, programs are in the new wave that in this case many areas of the world have that is basically uh well is the networking we do need a networking to do these kind of things to this kind of projects networking is essential to do that and this networking uh in this case is a construction okay is intended to gather as much people as we can to focus on one problem okay and in this problem just giving to the to the you know to the stakeholders to the politicians to the, uh, to the to the to the people okay tools to understand how to solve it how to regenerate it how to conserve how to do it in a, a, the, in a proper way networking is very important and you have to understand that the networking in this case is based on the transparency the trustable the trustability you have to trust each other also, the cooperation, the true cooperation, which is not easy in uh, in all days. This is why it's so important, for example, programs like the Air Center, in which, in a much more broader way, uh, Professor Moutinho do with, with their colleagues or, or, to just gather as much people as they can, to just connect, you know, different interests, different research teams, different politicians, different people of the economical scenario and so on and so on to, to just try to solve the huge problems that we have in front of us. Because at the end, what we do is basically in the ocean citizen, for example, what we do is try to solve the problem of the regeneration, which are, let us say, a, 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 a program that may be understood as a profitable problem from the socioeconomic point of view. So in the objective A, you have to define the blueprints of a replicator protocol for underwater coastal restoration. We have to understand the ecosystem services, design and implement ocean citizens technologies, identify the different characteristics, in this case of five different coastal ecosystems, we will see in the next slide. Okay, interact with other European projects. Also to have this kind of definition of the blueprints, giving a replicable protocol that can be exported elsewhere everywhere with different kind of approaches, with different kind of system, with different kind of local realities. And consolidate and evaluate an ecosystem-based business model for marine preservation. This, this design of the multi-stakeholder monitoring program define the standards factor to evaluate the impact of the design of the business model and identify the, uh, the quantify the socioeconomic impacts of the ecosystem ser services. Guys, this is a long-term project. In fact, it's not only four years. It will be much more. I mean, it, it is previewed to, to make this kind of approach at least for 50 years. Because when we are talking about regeneration, we are not making anything for us, for my generation, not even for my sons or for my daughters, but so probably for my natives. So when you think about it and you see the people that is truly making regeneration programs, we are all looking forward we are looking at the long term uh, uh, we are trying to looking at that in, in a long distance in the future so these are the areas of the project in which we are making this kind of approach of the citizen science what are they doing the people of the of the in, in this project well they are just uh, helping on the one side on the transplanting of the organisms in the water. They are also making the monitoring. They are also engaged in several activities that are related with the biodiversity and climate change follow-up. And they are actively doing it, especially in Tenerife, okay, in different areas, shallow, mesophotic, and continental shelf, uh, and other areas which are small pilots in which we try to understand if the model is really working if the model is really, uh, you know, has to be uh, changed, it has to be perfectioned, it has to be optimized in some way, 
trying to see, for example, if the, uh, the, 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 the let us say, the, this kind of protocols of regeneration have uh, uh, comparable biomass, biodiversity, and blue carbon uh, uh, prints, blueprints. What is to say, of course, that would be completely different in the Borges Fjordan uh, in the Arctic would be completely different the biodiversity from, for example, Eilat, which is in Israel, in the, in the Akaba, uh, uh, the Gulf of Akaba, or it would be completely different from the Baltic Sea or Tarragona in the Mediterranean or Tennis in the Atlantic. But, but if we have this kind of protocol that is systematically doing in the same way, we can just compare what we have in the different eco zone and in different areas. So at the end, uh, the idea is just to, to have the possibility to civilly and passively, of course, uh, just uh, make this approach of the uh, of the uh, regeneration in several areas in which can the citizen science is protagonist, is protagonist in many ways. But most importantly, at least from my point of view, is the possibility to make this kind of land and ocean bridge in the land, as you see here, let me put the pointer, okay. Okay, in the land, you have many facilities that will easy the work on the ocean, on the coastal areas. So here you have the local universities and research centers that are involved in the projects. We have research laboratories, okay, and biolabs, land aquaculture facilities, okay, to make this kind of approach of the needs of the local uh, mariculture, uh, especially. We are looking not for fishes, but especially we are looking for low energy associated organisms, like for example, um, macroalgae, seaweeds, or um, bivalves, tunicates, sponges, and so on and so on, which are the, the main focus of, of our project, okay? And also the aquatic in which the people has the opportunity to be involved in all these kind of activities. Which are the activities? The activities are basically from uh, from perspective of the remote operated vehicle, looking at the animal forest, making integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, diving activities that can be also, of course, playing, uh, making uh, uh, challenges, and so on and so on underwater, and also. You know this kind of uh, 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 let us say uh, bridge between different kind of methods, different kind of approaches to make regeneration uh, uh, feasible, and the habitat in this case restoration also a reality. Also, we are looking at uh, deep areas, not only the shallow areas, because everything is basically connected from the shallow to the deeper areas. At the end, what we do we have here is uh, uh, trying to involve people in this kind of activities and make gardens of the of the sea. So at the end, what you have is people that outside of the water, not everybody is a diver. Not everybody is a diver. Outside of the water or in the water are capable to just join this kind of action of regeneration in the area and give uh, you know give a hand in the restoration, in the large scale restoration. But on the other hand, they have the possibility, the, the possibility sorry, to be aware of the, uh, of the you know, the regeneration um, uh, uh, possibilities and of the functioning of the oceans, the functioning of the seas, the functioning of the, what I call the pelagos, the ventos, and so on and so on. So it's, uh, so what types is, can be considered something like a win-win perspective. To just uh, say that uh, this is the last, uh, this is the last uh, the, the slide. Uh, this is a change of paradigm, but especially this is a project in which we change, we try to change the perspective of our territory. So what we are doing, what we are trying to do here is try to pass from exploiters to caretakers just to say from this kind of degenerating, uh, 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 let us say, this kind of degenerating uh, uh, model, economic, socio-economical model that we have to a much more related with the regenerating model. So try not only to uh, be aware of what happens, not only to say, hey, look, this is happening and this is terrible and, and we have to do something, but do something. 
And this can, again, can be made on the coast, can be made in the interface with the coast and the, and the, and the, the sea. We can do it in the deeper areas and so on and so on, but always with this aim of passing from degenerating to regenerating. This kind of uh, technical system design has to be substituted by the living system design in which we all participate in this kind of regeneration program. And uh, it's, it's time, from my point of view, you know, uh, to be out of or uh, let us say, ivory tower or bubble as scientists and technicians and uh, and uh, environmentalists and so on, we do have to give all the tools that we can. And again, this is not uh, related directly with the, uh, let us say, uh, with the with the scientists per se. It's not that the scientist has to become a scientific journalist as I was, as I was or a, a, a book writer as he wants to, you know? No, 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 no. It's just keep in mind that we do need absolutely to give all the tools, all the channels possible to make the people understand what is happening. And not only with the, you know, with this kind of approach in which we say what is happening, in terms of climate change, in terms of pollution, in terms of uh, 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 coastal degradation, and so on and so on, but also trying to offer solutions, also for the politicians, also for the stakeholders, also for the investors. The people have to know that all the tools to transform deeply the territories are available. Transform the territories in a good way are available, but we don't have to just make it uh, you know, uh, 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 without uh, a real, sustainable, and profitable regenerative way. If you have any questions, I'm here, prepared. Okay, Sergio, Professor Sergio, thank you very much for your lecture, very enlightening too. And uh, okay, then we can start the round of questions and responses. Uh, from the two professors. Professor Ayara is with us again, Professor, welcome again. And uh, let me start with the, the first question. Come on. Um, wait a minute. Uh, the I, first I can question. see Talita, Talita asked the question. I can see that was the first one that came in. About Carl Sagan said in an interview that we've arranged society based on science and technology, in which yeah. nobody understands anything about science and technology, and that it would uh, sooner or later blow up in our faces. Uh, and then she asked, "What do you think about it nowadays? Have we made much progress?" Uh, I, 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 I'll probably answer first. Says you can answer <laughs> afterwards, but certainly uh, we've seen. I've seen in the in the states. Uh, and in Brazil and in the UK, that uh, in the news, there have been a lot of uh, articles suggesting that people are sick of uh, experts. They don't want experts. Uh, and, and perhaps that is one of the symptoms of the fact that we have got this. So potentially that that's uh, that's a symptom of, of what Carl Sagan said. 27 years ago is that that's we've gotten uh, an increasing amount of the populace that don't want to necessarily hear from experts they want to hear from normal people <laughs> and perhaps that's maybe because we're not we're not putting forward the uh, uh putting forward our uh, our viewpoints as well as we we potentially could I, I don't know what do you think Sergio I mean one of the things that is important um uh... Raymond, at least from my point of view, and this is dramatic from me, from my point of view, is that uh, science doesn't care what you believe. Science doesn't care what you believe. I mean, the, the data is there, the science is there, can be, you know, we are working on statistics, and of course, we are really cautioned. But at the end, you see that even if you're cautioned, they say, well, the probability to this is 85%. I say, okay, there is a 15, 15% in which we are safe. No, 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 you are not understanding. <laughs> so this kind of, of, uh, of approach is more and more evident, but it's also true that 
because there is a sector of people that is not neglectable at all, they want to go back to the 80s, okay? They want to go back to the 80s. They, go, they want to just go there because they were safe. They were, well, 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 well it, there, things are happening, but I don't want to see them. I don't want to see what is happening. But uh, I need someone that gives me the hope that things can be easily changed. And it's not easy at all. It's not easy at all. And this is why sometimes, and I saw in Spain, I saw you also in the United States, and also in Italy and in all the parts, probably here in Brazil, it's truth. For example, the, agric the, the agricultures, the people that is from uh, uh, certain, uh, let us say, parties, extremist parties, populist parties, as you said before, say, no, nothing, climate change is not happening. And they vote. And once they vote, they say, okay, but the drought is still here. What do we have to do? And they say, no, no, it's not here. It's not true. Okay, my, my cows are dying. My soya is not growing. And what happens? What is the, the, the solution here? I say, and then they say, look, it's right in here. There's a light. Look at the light. Say, no, guy, I have a problem and you have to solve it because you are the politician and I vote you. And this is a really huge problem that more and more there is a sector of people that doesn't want to know and absolutely nothing about the problems and they don't want to take action so we have to be on the one part active as scientists and also in some way quantitative so I say guys this is what is happening and then take action but take action now not after tomorrow uh, I, uh, Yara as well she said she said earlier about that kind of speaking to the people in the bars <laughs> I, I liked that. And actually, I, I in my local area, we have a thing where the, there's a pub, a local pub called The Bevy, and they have this thing called Brains at The Bevy. <laughs> so they get basically the, the, the researchers, they get the local researchers to come in and then they sit in a pub and they talk to, <laughs> to people in the pub. But obviously they kind of make it in a in a very uh, um, easily accessible uh, presentation because it's people sitting in a pub drinking. But it, I think that's that's quite a nice way to engage with, uh, with yeah. the local populace. And it's a good way to kind of put forward your view and get it into those communities where where people maybe aren't so engaged with with scientific literature. Like Yada said, if a few thousand, if a couple of thousand people have read your paper, that's a lot. <laughs> but we exactly. need to be engaging much more broadly with uh, with, with, with people. <laughs> that's a little bit frustrating sometimes. You know, you make a big paper, you know that it's the paper of your life, and then nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> Except the specialist of this. Hey, Carlos, MJ is fantastic. But the other people is, okay, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for both. Um, okay, let's make uh, one one more question. Is the director for Dr. Ward? Uh, doctor, what are the gaps in the mangrove study that should be addressed quickly? Uh, I, I do a lot of work with blue carbon, and and obviously it's quite topical. I've I've been working with blue carbon for fifteen years, uh, and in the UK, for example, that, that no one cared about it. So I was doing all my work elsewhere. Uh, there are a lot of areas. I, I, Yada pointed out there's a spotlight on blue carbon at the moment, but we don't know even like just from a from a kind of global perspective, how much carbon really is stored. We pick studies. OK, if you want to talk about uh, the UK now or the United States, yeah, there's loads of studies on blue carbon. But that means that all the global data sets are from <laughs> certain areas. Yeah, there are a lot of areas that are massively understudied uh, and it needs to be in partnership with the people that live there. Yeah. So it needs to be a case of getting kind of collaborative work because there are some things that you need certain equipment for collaborative kind of programs working together with with local researchers to actually increase that kind of global data set. And we don't really know how much carbon stored in the above ground biomass or below ground biomass, or even the soil organic carbon in a lot of areas. Yeah, so even just something as simple 
as taking soil cores and doing your kind of your biomass estimates from a broader range uh, of sites. I think that's really, really important. That as that's without going into the details of what are the factors influencing blue carbon, you know, where where have you got these hot, you know, because we need to identify where we've got these hot spots and what are the kind of driving factors that uh, that are that are influencing them. So yeah, I think a broader kind of uh, uh, recognition, particularly in the southern hemisphere, that that there aren't as many studies or any global studies need to take into account literature that may be isn't in English, it's maybe in Spanish or it's maybe in Portuguese. Okay, Ray, uh, thank you. Uh, there are another question, but uh, since uh, in the tomorrow uh, lecture, we will talk specifically about that, that the question is, is referring, I would uh, prefer to give the fourth question. Uh, are activities related to science outreach and communication sufficiently acknowledged by funding agencies? For example, when they analyze proposals and researchers' CVs, etc. Sergio, no. Ray? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, they are much more, they have a little bit more weight now. In Europe, for example, you have to dedicate 20% of your budget, theoretically, theoretically, 20% of your budget to communicate, disseminate um, this kind of citizen science projects and so on and so on. That's truth. So if you have 100,000 euros, 20,000, theoretically, you have to go to this kind of actions. This is not uh, accomplished. But when you are analyzing this, it's important or may have a weight, may have a weight, but Sometimes when it's individually looked at and in the sense that not the proposal, but the CV of the of the person who you are looking at, the CV of the main uh, of the principal investigator, the people that is involved and so on, they are looking basically at how much money you raise it, how many papers you have, which is the impact factor, your citation, so on and so on. So it's not so important. So, for example, in my case, I have a lot of this. I have one more than 120 uh, uh, scientific, uh, sorry, uh, papers in which, uh, from magazines or from newspapers, and also I was, there were two different um, blogs, okay? Nobody cares. In the, at the end, when you are, um, the, uh, you are analyzing this in the CV of the person, this is not really considered. Yeah, I okay. think from a national funding agency perspective, I've worked with several national funding agencies, it is it's not not as well represented as it should be uh if i want funding for a citizen science project i tend to go to uh private donors or i go for some of those non-standard uh funding uh groups but national funding agencies maybe they have a call but it's not like the standard thing it, it is kind of a, a, a bolt on what once in a while that you might maybe have citizen science calls Okay, thank you. Then we need to close this session. I uh, thank you very much for all the lecturers, for all the participants and listeners. We are closing this session, remembering that in the afternoon, 2 p.m. o'clock, uh, 5 p.m. at a.m. UTC hour, we will have a discussion session about urban mangroves, sorry, urban development associated risks for coastal ecosystems. Then again, you, all the lecturers and all the participants uh, for this session and see you later in the afternoon. Thank you again.
comunicar com os tipos de saúde. <risos> tá bom. Ah, nada, melhor, viu? Doente? Yes. Então, vou fechar. Aí vamos lá. O assume, não assume, mas assume. Não, vamos manter. Você, você pega o lugar de Marcelo. Eu já está toda a fala aqui, já, né?
Olá, boa tarde a todos. Me escutam bem? É... Então, agora nós vamos iniciar a tarde da nossa, a primeira tarde da nossa Spring School, né? A, uma sessão sobre Urban Development Associated Risks for Coastal Ecosystems. Né? I just have to remember you all that any questions to panelists can be made through the chat in YouTube and also through the question and answer uh, box here at Zoom. Okay? For this session, uh, I'm not Marcelo, I'm Talita. Unfortunately, we have to, to cancel Marcelo's participation because of some health issues. But uh, I'll be your host in this session. And uh, we will have uh, Dr. Raymond Ward, uh, Dr. Sergio Rossi, and also Dr. Samuel Passanha to, uh, to address this team. Okay, uh, before I pass the word to our, uh, to our panelists, we, I will read a short, um, a short CV of uh, each, on, each one of them, right? So, Professor Sergio Rossi, that already participated in our first session, he's a graduate MPA in biology by the Universita of Barcelona. He is specialized in marine natural resources, zoology and bio, biological oceanography, with a focus in climate change effects on density populations, marine vertebrate distribution, ecology and physiology, density pelagic conflict uh, processes, and marine wildlife conservation. He holds a vast expertise in field work with and experimental design, as well as coastal monitoring programs. Currently, Dr. Rossi works in marine biodiversity and global change, focusing on the role of environmental and biological factors in distribution and health of density organisms. So, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Rossi. Uh, our other panelist is Professor Samuel Camara, uh, Samuel Passanha, uh, which is, who is graduating in agronomy from the Federal University of Bahia. He holds a master degree in rural economics at the University of the Federal University of Ceará, and he has a doctorate in economics from the University of Pernambuco. He also complemented his postdoctoral studies in innovation management, and he is currently a, an associate professor at the State University of Ceará. His research interests lie in the areas of innovation management sustainability and marine economics. Also, welcome Professor Samuel Passanha. And our last panelist is Professor Raymond Ward, who has been here in the morning. And Professor uh, Dr. Ward is a graduate in environmental sciences with a PhD in environment, both by the University of Brighton, England. He's professor and researcher of the Queen Mary University of London, and, uh, and also of the Estonia University of Life Science in Estonia. Currently, Ray is, Ray, <laughs> our professor Raymond Ward is a reader at the Queen Mary, Mary University of London undertaking a research on the impacts of global change on coastal ecosystems, particularly mangrove, salt marshes, and seagrasses. Drawing on this precise in experiment, geochemistry, ecology, and geoinformatics. So I'll pass the word uh, first to, prof to Professor Samuel Passanha, which will share some slides as he uh, addresses some issues he has uh, he has bring about this this main topic that again is urban associate uh, urban development associated risk for coastal ecosystems. So please, prof uh, Professor Samuel. Uh, the the floor is yours. You can speak in Portuguese if you like, because as uh, I said in the beginning of the event, we have a simultaneous translation, and the, all the participants can uh, will have access to to the session.
Professor Samuel Façanha, aí você pode começar é, apresentando, você disse que tinha alguns slides né, para é, abordar o seu ponto de vista. Então, eu vou passar a primeira palavra para o professor Samuel. Em seguida, né, ele vai falar um pouco sobre o tema. Em seguida, eu vou passar a palavra para o professor é, Sérgio Rossi, também vai abordar o ponto de vista dele a respeito do tema. E em seguida, para o professor Raymond Ward. Né? Depois que os três tiverem apresentado seus pontos de vista, nós vamos é, começar o debate. Né? A ideia é que eles possam rebater a apresentação um do outro, assim como é, abordar levantamentos que surjam na plateia. Ok? Então, o professor Samuel, fica à vontade. Professor Samuel, está sem som. Pode ligar o seu microfone? Pronto, agora está ouvindo? Está me ouvindo? Agora, sim, professor, sim. escutamos. Está tá vendo a minha tela? Vocês estão vendo a minha tela? Estamos. Não, eu pensei que tinha travado aqui. Eu estava sendo o microfone também. Então, é, peço, peço perdão por não usar o inglês, embora eu até possa fazer, mas eu acho que fico mais confortável fazer em português. É, meu inglês não é tão bom assim, então acho melhor, já que tem o tradutor, é, me expressar na minha língua nativa, tá bem? Então, assim, é, a ideia é trazer aqui um pouco da minha área, né? Eu acho que a maioria dos, dos panelistas aqui são mais da área da biologia, da geologia, né? E a minha área é a área das ciências sociais aplicadas. É, eu milito na área da economia e na área da administração. Eu estou ligado hoje ao programa de mestrado e doutorado em administração. E por conexões com o E-Centro, inclusive, eu comecei a desenvolver trabalhos relacionados a essa questão né, da Blue Economy, da economia do mar, etc. É, olhando para essa para a questão do, do evento em si, eu acho que a gente pode tocar em duas, duas, duas questões importantes. Eu não estou conseguindo passar aqui o slide. Aqui, pronto. Então, duas questões, três questões importantes. A primeira questão diz respeito ao conhecimento sobre isso, de conhecimento sobre o impacto socioeconômico que eventos dessa natureza podem trazer, né, principalmente na região costeira. Então, a gente vem desenvolvendo, por exemplo, no meu grupo, alguns trabalhos relacionados à, à mensuração de indicadores de vulnerabilidade socioeconômica, e a literatura não vem tratando, e esse foi feito aqui para uma outra, para uma outra, para outra questão, para o derramamento de óleo que, eu, que houve aqui na costa do Nordeste, é, um pouco tempo atrás, e, e a gente tem essa, tem essa capacidade de desenvolver trabalhos dessa natureza, e a gente pode se é, reunir né, com pesquisadores é, que possam nos ajudar a mensurar o, a, o quão no território isso é capaz de... Fenômenos da natureza que estão sendo discutidos aqui são capazes de, 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 de impactar sobre, sobre os ambientes econômicos. Por exemplo, a gente fez aí uma mensuração sobre quais estabelecimentos, desenvolvemos um indicador relacionado a esses setores diferentes, que são só exemplos para a gente dar início a essa discussão. E são, são estudos dessa natureza, a gente fez para o Nordeste, fizemos para as áreas... É, é, de, de, de proteção ambiental, né? introduzimos questões relacionadas às comunidades que lá existem, e assim, a gente está estabelecendo essa relação, esse conhecimento é muito importante para a gente entender melhor quais seriam os possíveis impactos, não depois de acontecer, não são estudos de impacto, mas são estudos de vulnerabilidade que são muito relevantes para se preparar para fenômenos dessa natureza que vem cada vez sendo mais, se apresentando de forma mais intensa, né? Então, conhecimento disso é, um, é algo muito relevante, tem poucos trabalhos ainda que se debruçam a isso, nosso nosso grupo está querendo, está tá começando o trabalho dessa natureza, e aí vai aqui também um, um, um chamamento para que outros pesquisadores possam aí, de repente, é, su, se conectar com a gente para ajudar nessa, nessa, nesse desafio. Né? Outra, outra, outra coisa importante que eu acho que para o debate aqui é a gente entender que a gente precisa realizar essa ponte entre o conhecimento científico nas diversas áreas, inclusive na área de ciências sociais aplicadas, e o devido é, é, enfrentamento desse, dessas questões. Né? E aí eu trago essa ideia, por exemplo, sobre o trabalho do Leopoldo 
Cavalieri, que é um pesquisador brasileiro, que está na Espanha agora, eu estive com ele recentemente, né, sobre essa questão de como você concentrar conhecimentos, interagir esse conhecimento, produzir é, ações e políticas públicas relacionadas à ativação né, de, de instituições que possam, de fato, enfrentar e minimizar problemas é, que surjam a partir dessas questões que estão sendo discutidas aqui. Então, é, ele, su ele sugere, por exemplo, a questão dos... laboratórios do mundo real, como é que você se conecta né, entre os pesquisadores e todos esses outros atores que precisam, precisam estar presentes no enfrentamento desse problema. Isso é uma questão é, que eu vejo no Brasil, principalmente, com uma experiência que tem um problema sério de, de relacionamento, de, de interação entre todos esses agentes. A literatura e a pesquisa também pode dar uma contribuição importante, construindo e, e propondo ferramentas, espaços e instrumentos para que isso seja é, realizado da melhor forma possível. Né? Então, esse é um segundo ponto que eu acho muito relevante. E é, o terceiro é tratar isso do ponto de vista da gestão, provavelmente dito. E aí a, a gente vem fazendo alguns trabalhos no meu grupo a, é, adotando a nomenclatura de Wicked Problems, né, que é uma literatura que vem surgindo muito, que vem sendo abordada pela área da gestão de uma forma importante, porque você coloca a gestão e seus modelos tradicionais de gestão em xeque, porque você tem aí fenômenos que estão em que de ambiente complexo, de baixo controle, e todos os, quase todos os modelos de gestão que você tem vem na literatura e em uso, vem da, da, do mundo organizacional e pressupõe determinados níveis de controle que você não pode exercer né, em ambientes dessa natureza. Então, uma proposta de modelo de gestão, por exemplo, através da orquestração de redes, que é um trabalho que a gente está desenvolvendo também no nosso grupo, né, esse é um trabalho, esse framework que está aí do lado, ao lado do, da descrição do que seja o Wicked Problem, é um framework que nós estamos trabalhando sobre como ocorrem essas, essas orquestrações de rede, nesse caso é uma rede de inovação para enfrentamento de crise, foi para a Covid, nesse caso aqui, é, um trabalho que a gente fez para o entendimento de como foi proposto, por exemplo, o capacete Elmo, que é um capacete de, de respiração assistiva que foi produzido aqui no Ceará, que cortou o prazo de, de produção e inovação desse desse capacete em, em sei, é uma, é uma, realmente uma, uma trajetória longa, né? Na área de saúde, é, um país de economia emergente, então você tem uma uma, uma tradição, ou seja, de, de ter muito tempo para que isso ocorra. E eles fizeram isso aqui no espaço de seis meses, do zero até a ideia até isso estar tá, os hospitais salvando vidas. Então, assim, esse é um, esse me parece que é uma uma lógica, né? Que não se estabelece do ponto de vista dos controles ou das, dos modelos hierárquicos que nós estamos acostumados na área de gestão, que pode se adaptar muito bem a essas questões de fenômenos como o que a gente está tratando aqui na perspectiva dos chamados wicked problems. Então, esses são os três, os três tópicos que eu queria trazer para a gente discutir com os demais participantes. Né? A questão do conhecimento, né? da, da, do possível impacto da vulnerabilidade de regiões específicas em áreas, setores econômicos, etc., o segundo, instrumentos que possam levar esse conhecimento à efetividade do enfrentamento do problema, não adianta ficar discutindo isso só na academia, isso precisa, né, de alguma forma, é, transpor os muros da academia e, e estabelecer uma relação muito clara né, com agentes de enfrentamento e que estão expostos ao problema, e também uma, estabelecer novas, novas, novos modelos de gestão que possam ser efetivo, digamos assim, em ambientes dessa natureza, né, que você possa é, mudar um pouco o olhar da gestão que é baseada em controle para uma gestão com menos hierarquia e mais efetividade do ponto de vista da, do envolvimento dos atores presentes no, no enfrentamento né, desse, desse tipo de, de questões que a gente está tratando aqui. Então, é, era essa, rapidamente, só para que a gente não perca mais tempo com, com apresentações e, e com conceitos, só para colocar um pouco esse, esse ponto de vista né, de, três, de três pontos que eu acho que são relevantes para a gente possa discutir aqui e que eu posso dar alguma contribuição. Era isso, obrigado. Tá, então, os meus dados e tal. É, deixa eu dar, já, me apresentei, já me apresentaram, na verdade, né? Eu vou tirar aqui o nosso nossa apresentação. Um, obrigada, thank you, professor Samuel. Now uh, hand over to professor professor Sergio Rossi. Uh, uh, you may state your point uh, regarding this this topic. Okay, I don't know if you have to talk in English or in Portuguese or whatever. Okay, I will do it in English. 
but uh, I can shift to Portuñol because I don't have the Portuguese. They don't have the dominion of the Portuguese yet. <laughs> okay, not of the English. Uh, but I want to stress one thing here, just briefly, um, coastal areas have, uh, as many other areas, but are, are most of, you, you know, that are most, the most, uh, probably the most uh, impacted or pressed by many, many, uh, uh, let us say, uh, threats. That's true. That's, uh, that's a thing that we know. And we have to think about three different approaches that we have to take into account. The first is the environmental approach. Okay. The environmental approach takes into account direct impacts like pollution, like the uh, structuring of urban areas, harbors, uh, piers, uh, and new uh, um, structures that may be uh, in offshore, inshore, and so on and so on. Uh, and indirect impacts, like for example, climate change, especially related with the uh, sea level rise, but also about the ch deep change of the uh, traffic structure of the of the coastal areas due to the fact of the warming of the seas and the ocean acidification that we know very well. That's the environmental thing that we have to take into account and have to think about it. The second is the energetic one, the energetic one, not only linked with the decarbonization, which is, you know, is the, the main subject, decarbonization, which is good, but for the truth also related with the shortage of the, especially the light uh, petroleum derivatives, like for example, fuel, um, uh, diesel, uh, kerosene, and others that are more and more difficult to extract, mm -hmm. as you may know. And this is, has been just uh, put on the table by the uh, International Agency of the Energy, not only by the bloggers and so on and so on. This is a reality. And then this change of uh, uh, needs that we have on France. And the third is the economy. And the economic is uh, linked to many things, uh, but it's linked to the first two, to the environmental one, to the energetic one, and to the change of paradigm and the change of, if you want to see in this way, the change of vision that we have to have in front of what is happening. Part of that the, the, the we can discuss here for hours and days about the capitalist, not capitalist, and thing, so on. At the end, we will be, in some way, we will quite force it to the growth. In some one way or another, we have to just uh, understand that we cannot, we don't have, we don't have the the, the, the possibility to, indefinitely growth, uh, in the planet as we are doing today, as we are doing now with the same kind of model. So we have to change deeply or vision of what is happening. And this is why I insist quite a lot in two things about this economy. There are many others that will be as important or even more important, but I, there are two things that I think um, are quite interesting to discuss here. One is information and cooperation and take into account for once the truth uh, about the local needs that has been neglected many times. Many of the decisions are took in Brasilia, in Madrid, in Rome, or in Paris, or in, in Washington DC, or whatever. So they have a plan, a general plan, but they don't take into account what happens locally. And the second is try to make this, as, as I was uh, uh, talking this morning, shift a little bit, or vision of this kind of degenerative to regenerative uh, policies and uh, economical framework, which is not easy at all. I have been, you know, in this project that I'm just working with, I'm talking with people that is directly related with uh, the banks, the investors, people that is related with basically with the money, and they are still not in the mood. They are still not seeing, they have, they want to adapt the model as far as they can to the customer and try to make a, something like a makeup of the same politics, make the same things. But step by step, some of them, not all of them, please, are starting to understand that these points, the environmental, the energetic and the economic one are deeply changing, and this will affect the cost of development. In this cost of development, we have to take into account that we need in some way to uh, adapt the situation to the changing conditions, but also be sure 
that the local populations have commodities and facilities that give them the opportunity to continue living in this in this in these areas, take into account all these relevant impacts that are just coming from the environmental and energetic and this economic uh, uh, point of view. Oh, uh, thank you, Professor Sergio. And now I'll hand over to Professor Raymond, who will state his point of view about this before we begin to our discussion. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I'll probably stick with English as well. <laughs> Uh, maybe when we do the Mesa Donda, I can we can switch to Portuñol and Portuguese and the such like. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I, I've actually worked on a project uh, quite heavily with social scientists uh, on uh, it was looking at developing a coastal vulnerability index, which can mean anything. But I'll tell you what it actually meant for our project. <laughs> Uh, was we we had a team of uh, environmental scientists, physical geographers that were working on one part and a group of social scientists and policy developers uh, working on the other side. Uh, now, from my part, I was leading up the, the environmental science side. And essentially, it was it was a big project in Thailand. Uh, so th there was a big group from uh, of Thai researchers and then a group of uh, kind of more international uh, researchers from outside the country. What we were doing was we, we were doing the stuff that I do, which I was leading on, which was sort of climate modelling. We were looking at uh, flood modelling. So it was a lot of kind of GIS type work, trying to work out basically, first off, where's coastal flooding likely to occur? Yeah, these big kind of hydrometeorological hazards and how they actually kind of impact on your coastline. When I say coastline, I mean the, the, the bit that's kind of alive and then the, the bit that's made of sediment. So that kind of part. Uh, and then looking at climate modelling and seeing, OK, this is what's ha happening in the future. This is our our 10 year uh, recurrent kind of hydrometeorological hazard, our 50 year, our 100 year. Now let's put some climate forcing on it and get an idea of what's actually going to happen in the next 50 and then 100 years yeah, with those kind of flood events. So it's a big kind of that's a big kind of physical geography environment type project which is really interesting for people like me because we go and mess around with some numbers and then we see, okay, this is where the flooding's going to be. It's going to be in this urban area. It's going to be there. But then we brought in the uh, the social scientists and what they did is they went into those communities where we modelled this, worked out, okay, what was the socioeconomic status of these people? How did they deal with those hydrometeorological hazards at present and what kind of things would they like to see done in the future to help to protect them yeah then we we kind of got a, an idea of kind of a, a socioeconomic vulnerability index of coastal communities and then a kind of physical environmental vulnerability index of those communities because some communities are, are very well situated to adapt to those kind of hydrometeorological forcings. However, others are really likely to be substantially at risk, especially those that, are, for example, subsistence fishermen. Yeah, if the mangroves completely wiped out, that for example, is one of the areas that I work on, they no longer have access to their to their protein yeah, and to their livelihoods. Whereas other other communities maybe are much more resilient to that. So then we could work out, OK, this is the physical environmental vulnerability. This is the socioeconomic vulnerability. Then we can put the two together to see, OK, what is the actual vulnerability of the communities under these kind of hydrometeorological forces? So things such as big storm surges. And that way we then could feed that into the policy developers. Yeah, So we have big groups of, uh, uh, of local residents in there feed that into the policy uh, developers in the government that the representatives were parts of the project so that we could actually put in place some new kind of protection and new regulations to protect those communities. That That's something that I think is, is really, really vital. You can't just have the, the physical environmental scientists sat around tweaking some numbers, playing around. 
thinking, okay, well, this is what's going to happen there, and then publishing their scientific papers. It needs to have that other side, and not just as a bolt-on. It needs to be developed actually genuinely together with those two groups. So there are discussions at the beginning. I can develop a model, but I can develop lots of different types of models. What's going to be useful is a model that's actually going to help the, the social scientists so you can build the things together. Yeah, then you get the outputs that are actually, they're likely to be in synergy with each other. So I think that's, that's really important to get those those two groups of, uh, of people and then feed that back into the policy developers. Otherwise, there's not enough communication going on. And, you know, we can continue to get our grants to develop our, our projects. But that if they're not going to actually do anything, there's no point in doing it. There's no point in, in receiving those funds. So I think that's that's, uh, that's that's really important from that kind of perspective. Thank you, Professor Raymond. So uh, I will just uh, put some, some bullet points here. I think uh, I extracted from uh, the three uh, the three uh, talks you have just made, and then we can maybe address some of them, right? Uh, Professor Sergio uh, raised the question about information and cooperation. We can start discussion how to improve this, how to to go further with this. If, the, if it will be one of the, po the points. The other one, I, I think we can also discuss the local needs, how to, to make an equation where we consider vulnerability, uh, necessity of small and medium economies to grow versus the idea of degrowth, yeah? And also, how do those uh, those populations will have access to to live in the in, and also in this point, I have to to raise the the the, the issue of uh, some population some populations that are already at risk of disappearing. For example, there is a there was a discussion uh, some some months ago about uh, some islands in the in the pacifics that would become maybe uh, the the first vir virtual nation because of the the rising uh, sea level so uh, i thought we can start discussing those points so maybe information and cooperation could be the first right so uh, you can uh, i i will pass the word for you three In, okay. in the cooperation on, on, on the information, um, I briefly will say that, um, again, it's important to have a, a clear mechanism within the local community, but being honest with them and telling them what happened and what will happen. So if you are talking with, for example, um, people that is just um, here in Brazil, the communities that are on the shores and the fishermen that are on the shores, you have to have a plan to give them the opportunity to understand how they have to adapt. But it's because it's, it's a, as a matter of adaptation, adapt in terms of what will happen with their houses, what will happen with the water, with the drinkable water, what will happen with the fisheries, with the biomass that is uh, in the uh, nearby, and how this will change. These programs have to be effective and have to be accounted. Just warning the people what will happen and then giving them solutions. I didn't understand at the beginning, just at the beginning, 10 years ago, something like that, when there was so much interest in the islands. You know, there was so many, the islands, the islands, there were many meetings about the islands, the problem of the islands. And I would say, of course, there are islands in the Pacific, as Talita said, that will be uh, flooded and that will disappear in three, four decades, probably they will disappear, like Marshall Islands that are already disappearing, or other islands in the Pacific that in Micronesia, Polynesia, that are indeed uh, at risk. And then I understood that the problem is that, for example, focusing on the energetic problem, if these islands are not independent from the flow of, let us say, diesel, petroleum, you know, uh, gas, and so on, this will be the first that will be lost in the huge distribution of the energy in terms of 
uh, uh, of carbon, derivatives of carbon, hydrocarbons. So I started to understand that the problem of the islands is that they may have, in a, in a future, they may have a problem to get really isolated. And it's an island, I understand. But they are isolated from the rest. It is why they are connecting, making huge networks, the islands, all over the world. First was, for example, in Europe, or was in, in North America, or was in South America, or was basically also in the Pacific, just trying to meet together to find these kind of solutions that can give them the opportunity to uh, 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 share information and share problems and say, guys, how do you face the sea level rise? How do you will face the thing that we will ha wouldn't have drinkable water? How do you will face that we have greater storms and higher and more frequent and more intense hurricanes? On this kind of, of you know, of the local uh, uh, experience and local population that extrapolated to other uh, possibilities is an essential point. Uh, Alex has posted a question in there as well. Pro professors, is it, it it is possible in the urban or is it possible to, in the urban context uh, some efforts of inhabitants uh, who why which tribes to protect mangroves, for example, when it's a state that encroaches on the mangroves to construct facilities and license uh, harmful activities like carciniculture, for example. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that's very regionally dependent as well. I mean, from a Brazilian a Brazilian context is not the same as, for example, a Vietnamese or a or a Thai context. Um, I, I I can say for for that for that Thai Thai example, and I could probably use some Brazilian examples as well. That uh, it, it in in Thailand and again in in Vietnam, in actual fact, whilst the government's protecting many of those. Uh, ecosystems from, uh, for example, aquaculture. Yes, they are protecting those those ecosystems on paper, but that's not always necessarily how it works in reality. Uh, so what has happened is that uh, local uh, inhabitants have actually taken the initiative to go about restoration projects and kind of develop that together with the government. Uh, and that has resulted in uh, some of the highest rates uh, uh, of restoration of uh, of mangroves in the world, uh, both in Thailand and in Vietnam. So yes, it would. I'm, I think it would be wonderful if the government actually did what they were supposed to do, which is protect the the coastal ecosystems. But I think in reality that that isn't what happens, and you've got to face the reality on the ground. Um, uh, otherwise, you're just praying and hoping. Um, so I, I think yes, it probably shouldn't. The owner shouldn't necessarily be on uh, on the on on local people, but it, it often is. And I think if they know that they're going to get some results from uh, undertaking the work themselves, the the problem with that is is that in a local area you need to have a driver. You need to have a local person that's got that that strength, that power to think, you know, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to drive it forwards. If you don't have that, per if you have that person in one community, you don't have that person in another community, even if it's adjacent and he's undergoing the same kind of pressures, then you're not likely to get any results out of that. So, yeah, I guess that's how I would, uh, how I would answer that. It, it, it also requires the government to not be against that type of, uh, work because in some countries there are there's quite strict legislation. No, the government is protecting it, and no one else can get involved, even if they don't do what they're supposed to do. That was in response to your question, Alex. <laughs> you're you're on mute, Alex. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, I, I asked I ask, uh, I made that question because in Natal, when I live. The municipality of the city of Natal are thinking to cut close to 800 hectares of mangrove to uh, uh, put more port facilities. So I'm thinking everybody knows that the trees, the forest are very important for, for climate change, and the municipality of a, of a city think in, in cut close to, to 800 hectares of mangrove. 
we don't explain sufficiently for all the people, for all the plants that the trees are extremely necessary. How a municipality uh, think to make that? Then I don't know why they, they, they're not think they're not know the problems. Uh, this motivate my 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 question. Understand? I wouldn't necessarily say they don't know what the problems are. <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes it's just a question yeah. of money. Yeah. Think, uh, <laughs> this addresses another point that it, which is the gap that we have. Mm -hmm. Please mute, please mute your, uh, I'm so sorry about it because Alex and me and myself, we are in the same room. <laughs> so sometimes this, this happens. So uh, we, we know that there is a great gap uh, between the decision makers and the scientists and the population. And about this, I think Professor Samuel Passanha could uh, talk a little bit uh, also about the, the our state program, the, the chief science as, as well, in which we try to, to, to curtain this, this, this gap. Alita, posso falar em português? Vai ter alguém traduzindo? Posso? Yes. É, desculpe, mais uma vez. Bom, é, eu, eu acho muito importante essas questões, né? porque vai haver sempre conflito entre os diferentes atores. Né? É um tipo de problema que você não tem como evitar conflitos. Você vai ter sempre presente. Dentro do próprio governo, você tem opiniões conflituosas. Você tem, um, uma, por exemplo, um organismo de proteção ambiental quanto um organismo de desenvolvimento econômico. Eles, eles estão em constante embates. Né? Isso é uma questão que não é só brasileira, isso é uma questão né, do mundo inteiro. E gerenciar isso é uma questão muito difícil, né? porque você, uma, uma instituição não possui poder hierárquico sobre a outra, mesmo tendo um governador do Estado, por exemplo, ou um prefeito. Né? Essas instituições elas acabam construindo né, seus próprios poderes e exercem esse poder sobre essas diferentes questões. Então, é, esse, é um, esse, na minha opinião, é da, da, da visão da área das ciências sociais, o professor Raymond falou tanto sobre essa questão da junção dos dois tipos de cientistas, eu acho que ele tem toda a razão, a gente procura sempre fazer isso, né? mas assim, é, é uma questão importante, essa, 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 eu vejo essa, essa discussão, ela não é, ela não é tão ampla, né? e deveria ser, ser muito importante de construir modelos que pudessem fazer essa, essa gestão é, de alguma forma, né, gerenciando esses conflitos, estabelecendo é, construções e pontes entre esses atores, mediando conflitos e tentando encontrar a melhor solução possível. Você não vai agradar ambientalistas totalmente e empresários totalmente. Essa é uma questão que se, não tem como você fazer isso. Então, essa, essa relação vai ser sempre uma relação de discussão. Né? Me parece que o ambiente... É, pode ser construído nesse, nesse formato, não é, não é trivial, é uma coisa muito difícil de fazer, realmente, mas o modelo de gestão ele precisa ser encarado no, no formato diferente, não no formato organizacional, onde você precisa ter alguém que mande para que as coisas aconteçam, porque simplesmente ninguém vai conseguir mandar em todos os atores que estão presentes nesse tipo de problema. Até uma legislação, que é uma coisa mandatória, o tanto que a gente não, não vê de exemplos né, que os at outros autores conseguem... Aqui no Brasil a gente tem essa questão da lei que pega e da lei que não pega, né? por exemplo. Então, isso está exatamente associado a essas questões de que há insurgências, tanto do lado como do outro, que se estabelecem né, é, contra determinados níveis de hierarquia. Então, o um modelo em rede, talvez, com orquestrações distribuídas, o um modelo de orquestração distribuída, seja uma solução que a gente precisa tentar encaminhar. Você tem, você tem estudo, você tem, tem piloto, precisa ser construído, isso precisa ser construída, essas pontes precisam ser construídas, né? e isso é, um, é, um, é uma tarefa bastante difícil, que eu acho que os pesquisadores da área das, das ciências sociais aplicadas, so, sociólogos, administradores, economistas, junto com, com os ambientalistas, biólogos, geólogos, etc., podem conjuntamente transferir esse tipo de, de conhecimento de modelo para que os agentes possam é, se enquadrar. É, eu acho que é uma proposta muito interessante que a gente podia... É, aqui no âmbito do cientista-chefe, no, no, no caso do Ceará, encaminhar isso, pelo menos você tem governo e, e, e academia conversando de forma mais franca, né? O cientista-chefe de meio ambiente, o cientista-chefe na área de pesca, você tem, eu que sou cientista-chefe de inovação, 
e outros é, pesquisadores que estão hoje envolvidos nessa questão. Por exemplo, no caso aqui do Ceará, a cassinocultura é, um, é uma questão muito, muito relevante, invadindo, a, não saindo da costa, invadindo toda a parte do interior do Estado. Né? O, o Ceará tem um problema de recursos hídricos importantes. Essa discussão toda precisa ser construída. Né? Então, é, essa acho que é a linha que a gente precisa de alguma maneira, enfrentar aí com, com, com conhecimento. Né? Isso, é, isso é o mais importante, e experiência disso tudo. In, in line with the, what uh, uh, Professor Samuel said, I want to say that uh, there are two things that are very important. The one is the scale, and the other is effectively the money. The one is the scale. Okay, imagine two countries that will be deeply affected by the rise of the sea level. Netherlands and Bangladesh. Netherlands, they already have a huge program, extremely expensive, that will just uh, fight against the sea level rise. It, if it exists, they publish it. They have been making consulting, local councils, lo local things. Um, they have extrapolated, making models, making things. And they will invest an absolutely immoral quantity of money to just <laughs> to have the possibility to survive. Remember that Netherlands have been fighting against the sea during centuries. Okay. And then you have Bangladesh. Bangladesh will have, uh, in the next century, probably the 60% of their territory completely flooded. Okay? And they have no information. They they, they they see day by day that they don't have this, the next, the, 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 you know, the same territory, that there is a transgression of the sea in the, in, the, in the place, and so on and so on. But they are not, not informed as a country They don't have this kind of plan, as uh, Professor Sam would say, something like communication, just be clear and try to find something, because if not, you will have an exodus. It will be not a migration. It will be an exodus of people that will go out of Bangladesh and will go, I don't know, not sure about what will happen, but the, the, the people will disappear. So it's a different scale and a different kind of non-investment in the progress that have to be in each in each place there's an airplane going overhead hopefully it's not too loud but that's uh that's a good point particularly raising about uh about ba bangladesh uh and people not necessarily uh in the future having anywhere to go but i think that's even already the case in the fact that many people who live and work in the sundarbans the the largest mangrove uh, uh, uh area in the world They, uh, many people are very, very poor. The subsistence uh, farmers or subsistence kind of livers in that area, subsistence fishermen. Uh, they own some of the land, but they don't necessarily always have the paperwork. Some of them are, uh, uh, they don't, uh, are illiterate, so they don't have may maybe necessarily even the access to, to, to kind of any assistance to, to help them to move. So when it actually comes to the fact that they've lost their land and many people already have lost large areas of their land, Yes, they can move back, but but people own the land that's behind them. If they've got paperwork, yes, they can go. The government will have said, okay, well, we will relocate you to another area. But if they haven't got the paperwork, and many people don't have the paperwork, then they they've essentially they've lost their entire livelihood. So you do end up with that that problem uh, that that's going to result in in migration and already has because it's one of the areas where migration out of the country is is, is very very high. In the Netherlands, they actually have it written into their constitution that they will not lose any land, any of their country. <laughs> so, yes, the, uh, large parts of the country are already well under sea level, but they have uh, in their constitution that they, they they will not lose that land. So that's 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 it. That it, it will not be lost. Uh, concerning uh, complexities within government. I know we were talking about kind of state government actors and maybe you've got uh, the people who are working in the development part of the, the government, the people who are working more on the environmental side is even more complex than that. Because, uh, for example, here in uh, in the UK, uh, where, where I'm based uh, some, some of the time, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, our Ministry for the Environment is the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. So within that, this is our, our Department for the Environment. We've got the farmers, we got the fishermen, then we've got the environment agency, which is dealing with flooding. 
We've got our natural England, which is dealing with the, the sort of kind of ecological protections. OK, we've got a lot of laws, but many of them are contradictory to each other. So you've got groups within the within the Ministry for Environment that are saying, OK, we have to protect this area. Then you've got the fishermen saying, well, hang on, hang on. You can't do that because it's going to affect the fishing. Upstream, you've got the farmers saying, no, 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 hang on, you can't do that. But even within the Department for the Environment, yeah, there are there's multiple actors that are not necessarily always working or towards the same goal. However, they do they are having them all sitting in the same department means they do have to have discussions, just means that things take a very, very, very long time to actually reach any consensus. Yeah. In Brazil, it's quite complex as well, because not only have you got state government, but you've also got federal government on top of that and the municipalities, etc. So m multiple levels of government. There will be lure, uh, dire decisions. And as Professor Salmon said, nobody will be happy because in a negotiation at the end, nobody's completely happy. This is a negotiation if you want. And, uh, you know, and 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 it, it, uh, the more the time it passes, the more difficult will be this kind of negotiation. I'm afraid about that, and also I'm afraid also about this kind of models in which you uh, want to be green. I'm European, uh, but I want to be green, uh, but I need that the others are not green or are less green than us because then I can be green. And this is the management of the territory. And here in Brazil, for example, all this kind of uh, offshore wind farms, it's okay, uh, it's a thing that may find that it may be good if it's really, really well done. If not, the management of the territory is an expense, a huge expense for one or two or three countries that will fuel in some way the green, in, 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 some, uh, in some way, the green objectives of the agenda of another continent. And this is also a thing that I'm really worried about, not only about Europe and Latin America or Africa and so on, but in general, because we are not changing the way in which we think about truly cooperation, try to think about, you know, not only ourselves, our community or what happens, but also to the other's possibilities. And, uh, and, and I don't agree with that at all. It's not that you don't have to make a change in the energetic way you but have to plan things in another way, especially take into account, at least from my point of view, that we cannot ever, never, ever substitute fossil fuels, the same amount of energy with alternative energies. This is, this is completely impossible. And if you know about energy a little bit, I know a little bit, but I know something about energy you see that this is completely impossible you cannot do that and then making this kind of okay i will just be more green but just give me the hydrogen or give me the you know the electricity or give me whatever is uh, a complicated question i think uh, i think that maybe we can go Take this this link Sergio just just, just made uh, with the local needs and the balance between growth and degrowth, mainly concerning those small and medium economies that wants to grow, right? <laughs> wants to yes, wants to have economic uh, expansion, wants to to address the its national needs. You know, uh, yeah, I think we can address this point maybe. I don't know who wants to address. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I do have quite long conversations with uh, friends and family here <laughs> in, in Brazil uh, about uh, about the kind of green type developments and how we should be protecting our coastal ecosystems uh and i i quite often have people making a, a point that obviously those people that are uh living under kind of it, on the breadline so kind of subsistence living uh they're less likely to be 
that bothered about uh, development and conversion of mangroves to aquaculture if they think they can get a job there. So it's kind of uh, addressing the the underlying kind of economic requirements of uh, of people as well as kind of developing things in discussion with uh, with local actors so that you can actually uh, address uh, the needs that they have already highlighted rather than just focusing on well we need to educate them for to say okay you shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that because that's 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 kind of coming in <laughs> kind of telling people what to do that's uh, that's not 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 necessarily the best way to 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 go about that uh uh, that type of work. I think Sam, somewhere I, I got the feeling you <laughs> you wanted to jump in there. Acho que você sabe melhor do que eu. É o seu trabalho. Eu vou passar para você. É, eu, 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 eu acho que uma, vou continuar em português, se vocês me permitem. Uma, uma, acho que uma questão importante. me parece, é que esse tipo de problema, né, que, de aumento dos níveis, do nível do mar, aumento das marés, das inundações, etc., isso é uma coisa que me parece, me parece um problema de, de que você está perto do abismo e você não consegue enxergar o abismo. Né? Então, o cientista, quando ele usa essa lente da ciência, ele, aproxima, ele se aproxima do abismo, ele tem uma clareza né, de que aquilo vai acontecer, mas tem muita gente no mundo que não tem a mesma lente. Então, na cabeça deles, eles estão muito longe disso. Né? Quanto mais longe as pessoas tiverem essa percepção, menos elas estarão envolvidas na solução do problema. Essa é uma questão lógica. Né? E a gente está falando de, de todo mundo. Estou falando das, a gente fala de governo, estou falando de pessoas. Estou falando de empresas, estou falando de pessoas. Né? Essa é uma questão que a gestão e a, e a, e a área das ciências sociais, ela olha, assim, a gente tem feito alguns estudos sobre percepção de, de mudança climática. É, é assustador isso. Né? É assim, uma coisa que você, a gente começa a entender que... As, É, é, tem grupos, são grupos pequenos, que a percepção é infinitamente maior e, a, e outros que a percepção é infinitamente menor. Isso depende de onde as pessoas estão, qual é a formação que elas têm. Enfim, uma série de, de questões. E, e esse, esse nível de, de entendimento do, dos problemas né, relacionados à mudança climática, essa questão dos oceanos, né, o impacto que isso pode ter na vida urbana de países como o Brasil, Né? É, é uma questão que, que depende de como as pessoas estão estão vendo isso né assim porque é, é simples assim é, você vai você vai ter uma rede tanto mais engajada quanto elas percebem por exemplo nesse caso que a gente está estudando lá do, do, estudamos do Elmo né que é uma uma solução para Covid na, na época as pessoas estavam todas lá querendo salvar vidas era assim, uma coisa que estava muito as pessoas estavam dentro de casa querendo contribuir estava todo mundo imbuído a visão a crise colocou o abismo estava ali Os caras estavam na beira do abismo, né? E isso fez com que eles se juntassem muito mais facilmente. É, essa é uma questão que a gente vem estudando sobre redes, sobre as, as, as ações terão que vir sobre rede, o valor sobre isso terá que vir sobre rede, não tem como ser diferente, porque é um problema com múltiplas facetas, né? Uma, uma organização, o governo só não resolve, né? Então, enfim... Quando você olha dessa forma, as lentes são diferentes. Quando todo mundo está com a mesma lente, as coisas funcionam bem. Quando está todo mundo com lentes diferentes, as coisas entram na, 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 no campo dos conflitos. Ou seja, o cara diz, não, esse aqui eu posso explorar, três gerações minhas ainda vão receber essa riqueza e eu quero que o resto exploda. Enquanto que alguém pode dizer, não, mas espera aí, eu estou preocupado com meus netos, com, a, com, né, com como vai ser o mundo. Né, com uma lente, o cara... traz aquele problema para próximo dele. Né? Ele tem essa capacidade, digamos, reflexiva que os pesquisadores cientistas normalmente possuem, normalmente possuem. Né? Então, assim, eu, eu, a gente está falando dessa, 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 eu acho que dessa capacidade desses atores né, estarem na mesma página. Dificilmente estarão, dificilmente estarão. Mas o que, é que a gente pode construir para que eles não estejam em páginas tão diferentes? Né? Que não estejam, um esteja lá no começo do livro e o outro já esteja dando spoiler do que vai acontecer, né? essas coisas sejam, sejam mais próximas. E a ciência tem um papel importante nisso, mas a ciência tem um papel importante na comunicação. O professor Sérgio falou sobre isso desde o início, e eu, eu concordo plenamente. Essa questão da comunicação é algo muito relevante. A ciência precisa se comunicar de uma forma mais... Né? Eu acho que a área ambiental tem feito isso, uma das áreas que mais comunica hoje, até porque né, permeia aí os, todas as mídias, mas mesmo assim, hoje... A mídia central não é mais a que, a que promove comunicação, né? a gente está num, outro, num outro, outro patamar de comunicação hoje com as mídias sociais, e a ciência precisa aprender 
quando ela estava aprendendo a se comunicar com as, com as mídias tradicionais, vieram as mídias sociais para a gente começar a aprender tudo de novo. Né? Então, assim, a gente precisa aprender a se comunicar para tentar fazer com que esses atores, minimamente, essas redes precisam ser formadas nesse, nesse pressuposto. Assim, o Brasil, o Brasil tem uma dificuldade enorme, vocês sabem, o problema é que as comunicações, né? feitas da forma que foram feitas aqui no Brasil, construiu sobre percepção de futuro do país. Então, essa é uma questão importante para tudo. Me parece que questões relacionadas à mudança climática estão tá no centro de tudo isso e a gente precisa trabalhar muito, muito mesmo, interligadamente, cada vez, não só, como o professor Raymond falou, cada um produzindo os seus dados para mandar para papers, mas efetivamente construindo um conhecimento que possa é, impactar, né? E eu, eu faço minha culpa também, porque a minha vida, como de todos vocês, é de produção de papers, mas a gente tem que fazer um esforço nessa, nesse sentido e temos que muito caminhar juntos nessa, nessa direção aí. Acho que eventos como esse, por exemplo, a relação que a minha universidade, o centro de administração tem com o Labomar hoje, né, que é um centro importante aqui no Estado, promove essas questões, de vem promovendo essa, essa aproximação e cada vez mais isso tem que ser feito, porque... O comportamento humano é central nessa, nessa perspectiva, né? a percepção de, desse, desse abismo é muito importante. Então, eu acho que o brasileiro e o Brasil em si é um, é um desafio, como os outros, em alguns outros países também, ainda maior, eu acho, dada aí as experiências recentes que o país vem vivendo. É, não sei se contribui, mas eu acho que é um pouco da minha visão dessa, dessa, dessa lógica. É interessante usar o abismo... Um, I, I think that's, uh, uh, it, it is important that people kind of see and feel that this is actually something that, that really is happening. The, the example that Talita gave was uh, people who are living on Pacific Islands that generally actually have to go somewhere else. Uh, in fact, Australia has said, uh, I think it was for Palau or Vanuatu, they said, uh, actually, you can have passports and come and live here because there's nowhere else to live. Yeah, which is that that is them right on the edge of the abyss, looking over, saying, actually, we, we have nowhere to go. And it's funny because these conversations about uh, about climate change all over the world, I've had. Obviously, there are people that think, OK, this is a big problem. We need to address it. But there are other people that say oh, it's not such a big thing. I can remember having these discussions uh, in the south of Brazil. Uh, repeatedly that oh, it's not really such a big problem it's not such a big problem I was chatting to someone from Santa Catarina the other day and he was saying oh, I think it's a really big problem now because there's a massive storm yeah. and there's been loads of storms battering Santa Catarina suddenly it is on your doorstep this is happening right now it's not for yeah, my it's children exactly. it's not for my grandchildren this is what's happening right now oh someone's My basement's flooded, and uh, you can't drive down the beach anymore because it's not there. So this is this is genuinely putting it right in front of you, and that that's the cut. But the problem is, is that we're waiting till okay now. Okay, my house is underwater, uh, and uh, my children, I can't see them because they're on the other side of the road, and I can't swim across there. You know that that's that's already too late. The IPCC people were reading the report. You read the report. They try to lighten it. They have these these discussions. With the government, you can only say this much. The first IPCC report, you read that, all the papers around at the time say, I think it's going to be a bit worse than that. Second IPCC report, I think it's going to be a little bit worse than that. Th this one, I read it, I was like, oh. <laughs> 10 years ago, I was reading papers that say it's not going to be, it's going to be much worse than that. We know it is, but you have to get the consensus for IPCC for this actually to come out. But every, you know, when you get to the sixth one, you kind of like, all right, it's just... <laughs> that's, that's a very important, that's a very important thing. And when I was talking during this last three years, especially now that, the, 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 you know, the people, in other words, the people that has the money, um, Uh, 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 have a different vision in some way they have okay but you scientists have been a little bit alarmist because i say okay guys in a meeting and we were there where all the people there was all these the very different uh let us say uh persons of different uh, you know sensibilities different branch of knowledge different expertise professional and then I said, okay, the first thing that we have to to understand is that we are, you know, because we are in an emergency. 
Okay, that was the first point in which they say, okay, but if you say that we are in an emergency, this is alarming, and you scientists have been alarming the people during the last three decades. And say, what? Uh, no, I mean, we were just putting the data on the table and saying this may happen. The probability to be these kind of things will be this. This is connected with this other phenomenon that will have this impact. But we are not alarmist. The thing is that during the last three, four years, because things are getting more and more real, of course, media is increasing the voice of what is happening also because of this kind of social movements and so on and so on. So imagine, and this, this is for you, or for both you, but for all the people that is here listening, listen to me now, they are looking at the benefit and say, okay, but we have to have some benefit about that and we have to talk about the customer and say, okay, but if the customer is not there in 25 years, look what is happening with the insurance companies. They are fired because they knew before 2008, 2010, I have had this discussion with companies of insurance companies that cannot insure anything that is in certain areas. They cannot insure houses, roads, schools, petroleum refineries, because it's impossible for them because they know that it will come a hurricane, it will come flood, it will come a wildfire, whatever, for which stupid thing fall out. Well, that is okay. I think it's the other way around, guys. We have to admit that we have an emergency. When we understand which kind of emergency we have, then start about talking about the adaptation of the business, the adaptation of the money, the adaptation of the, uh, uh, you know, this kind of, of economic opportunities to the reality. Normally, the other way around. At least for me, but it's complicated. <laughs> Uh, I want to complicate a bit more. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask you about what about the dislocated populations? Because nowadays we have lots of dislocated populations regarding related to many wars that uh, happens uh, all the time, right? And uh, they are externalities, right? They are uh, externalities in the sense of uh, negative effects of some actions, but uh, they did not they did not do this for themselves. They are not guilty for losing a country, for example. So uh, who are going to pay for it, right? There is a a, a company you can you can charge. No, there isn't. How, so how you see this situation that uh, in a few months or years we will have to to, to see to Palau or talk to Valu and this will increase uh, in, in the years to come, right? So who is going to pay for it? I, I don't think anyone can answer that question. This is every time there's a, a big IPCC meeting, this is where they get stuck. <laughs> but but like completely stuck that like there's no decision ever made. So I, I, I think it would be uh, beyond our capability to, <laughs> to, to, to answer that question. I don't know if anyone else wants to have a go, but. That that is genuinely the the massive sticking point is who pays for this. You know, if people are, uh, you know, is it the developed countries? Is it uh, people in the local in the in the immediate region that are that are, that are, are required to have kind of some kind of relocation uh, strategy in place? I don't know. I think that's a, a, is beyond my ability at least <laughs> to, to to answer. There's multiple problems involved in that. So uh, and I I know that everyone will be it will be the uh, go into a to a to a bar and uh, you're you I haven't got my wallet you know kind of thing oh can you get me 
you know, someone else is going to pay. I think that would be that. That's where it, it kind of ends up pretty much every time. At some point, yes, I, I'm sure there will be a shakedown. It will get to a crisis point, and a decision will be made. But as to what that's going to be, who knows? Who knows? Again, this is very important uh, point. One thing is having a plan to relocate people, and Talitha has highlighted one thing that is extremely important. Is this why I said from the beginning, we do have to have a plan, we do have to be transparent as much as we can, even if what we will say is not comfortable for the people, not for anybody. On the other side, who will go into pay? On the one side, I would say that now enterprises are looking at the possibility to compensate. And I said in this kind of forums, no, you don't have to compensate. You have to stop on the one side, to make this kind of, you have to make a decarbonization, truly decarbonate. And on the other side, you have to regenerate. You have to do it. You have to regenerate the, 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 the different biomass, the different habitats, and so on and so on. And who is going to pay? Well, now there are open processes. One of the processes, for example, in Netherlands again, and there are some people that directly just put on the table against the government saying, we do lie. You have the information. You didn't make uh, a fully, you know, uh, 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 you, you didn't make a, a, a true plan of, uh, uh, let us say, adaptation. And now we are processing you as a government because you have to pay. They will pay, I don't know. As, as this person said, I don't know. These kind of movements are more and more frequent also for, for, against Exxon, against Total Fina against all the kind of huge companies that are now on the stake, they are now, and the, you know, they have the problem that the people is saying, you knew it, you didn't say anything, you didn't make anything, and you have the possibility and you still have the lobbies in the COP27, 26, 28, in the 28, there, are, there will be hundreds of lobbies there. They just try to convince that still you have to give subsidized to the, for the uh, oil companies and so on and so on. So what we are talking about? Eu acho que a gente tem uma, uma questão importante que é, a economia sempre tem um sempre tem um problema muito sério quando você tem questões problemas de causas difusas, né? Então é, quem paga a conta é muito difícil de estabelecer quando você tem um derramamento de petróleo que você sabe aqui no Ceará teve é, no Nordeste teve esse, esse coisa do vazamento do óleo, até hoje não sabe direito quem vai, você vai culpar quem? Você não chegaram à conclusão de fato quem é o culpado. Então, ninguém paga a conta. A conta vai para quem né, se, se, se teve problema, né? a conta vai para quem se, se... A própria punição já está no fato da pessoa ir para outro lugar. Né? Então, quando você tem causas difusas, você tem esse problema. Esse é um problema sério, né? que você precisa resolver com, com alternativas, do ponto de vista da, da lógica econômica também. Ou seja, você precisa... Se é causa difusa, tem todo mundo que pagar um pouco proporcionalmente a quem contribui com o problema. É claro que isso é muito difícil de fazer. Tá aí os créditos de carbono que nos, nos deixam mentir, da dificuldade que isso é, né, da associação de países relacionados a isso. Então, esse, esse é um problema, como o professor Raymond falou, que nem tomando todas as cervejas lá do, do pub você vai conseguir é, resolver. Né? Assim, é um problema muito difícil, muito difícil de resolver e existe essa lógica, mas a gente sabe que é uma lógica muito complicada. A, associada a isso, você tem um mundo hoje muito mais xenofóbico do que ele já foi, na minha opinião, mais recentemente. Né? Se as pessoas, a reação das pessoas em relação às pessoas que, a outras pessoas que vêm de outros lugares, né? é, até dentro do próprio país, né? você tem, se você tem alguma migração de uma região para outra, as pessoas... Ah, esses caras me tomam aqui meu emprego, você tem toda essa, essa lógica da do efeito negativo, né, o suposto efeito negativo da migração, que até do ponto de vista econômico é altamente discutível, né? Você não tem nenhum estudo que diz assim, ah, isso é, com certeza existem muitos efeitos, ou o efeito será sempre negativo das migrações. Não, não existe nenhum estudo conclusivo que possa dizer isso. Então, não tem como você estabelecer claramente é, essa lógica. E, a, e o mundo está ficando cada vez mais xenofóbico. Ou pelo menos a gente, a gente começa a perceber, eu pelo menos começo a perceber isso. Eu não, não, nunca li nenhum artigo sobre isso, mas é uma percepção que eu acho que todos nós temos, assim, de, que, de que cada vez mais né, os movimentos migratórios começam a, 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 a ficar cada vez mais intensos, com uma diversidade de questões, 
e que inclui as mudanças climáticas, mas inclui outras questões associadas a isso. E, e, e a própria globalização, a forma como as pessoas se movimentam hoje né, e enxergam outros países como oportunidade. É, e do, os estudos de migração, por exemplo, mostram que ninguém migra porque quer. Assim, é muito difícil a migração espontânea. O cara, é, assim, é menos de 1%, eu acho, dos estudos que eu li, é, a migração espontânea é muito baixa. Assim, o cara, é só, a pessoa só migra mesmo mesmo tendo um vizinho melhor ali, ele prefere ficar na casa dele, com os vizinhos dele, onde a família dele está, onde a cultura dele está, mesmo que ele não tenha uma vida é, equivalente, né? qualidade de vida equivalente a um vizinho próximo, a um país vizinho próximo. Então, assim, é muito difícil a gente resolver esse problema. A Thalita botou a gente aqui no que a gente chama aqui de sinuca de bico, né? não sei como é que você vai traduzir isso. Fica por conta do tradutor aí, resolver o problema. <risos> Mas é exatamente isso que ela fez também. Tá é isso. Ah, é, sinuca de pico vai ser hard to get. But one last point, we, we have reached almost one hour and 30 minutes of discussion. Uh, but I, I, I want to, you... I want to think up to know what do you think about the new found financial mechanisms that the global biodiversity framework has come with or is coming with at least um, because I, I think this is related to the last point right? because um, they are uh, they have to come up with some money to address these. global uh, problem with, uh, regarding specifically biodiversity. So uh, so now the point would be this financial financial mechanisms of the global biodiversity framework. Is anyone seen the uh, the, the the Plan Vivo uh, report that came out fairly fairly recently about developing biodiversity credits? And carbon credits have been around for for a while. Blue carbon's coming slowly, <laughs> probably. Uh, but but the biodiversity credits that's uh, that that's 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 one way that they they're seeking to to address that. Basically, uh, trying to uh, maintain uh, ecosystems that have have or support uh, high levels of biodiversity. Uh, I mean, a mangrove on particularly like, a, say, for example, one in Fortaleza, you, biodiversity is not only those four kind of species of, uh, of trees, but you've also got all that supporting diversity. And that can be enormous. Even salt marshes, I, I, I said to you that, they're, you know, generally they don't look like they support much biodiversity in seagrasses as well. But actually, seagrasses can rival coral reefs from a, a biodiversity perspective. If you look at all the different kind of supporting epiphytic type uh, species that are in there, if you can actually kind of protect that from a uh, from a biodiversity perspective and those biodiversity credits actually start to come in and you include the supporting biodiversity as well, including those that are not just using that exclusively as a habitat, then potentially that could be another mechanism to support conservation. Uh, I, I work a lot with blue carbon, but I also work a lot with biodiversity. And what I don't think that... Blue carbon carbon credits are, 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 are a nice idea if it's to protect an ecosystem. If you're going to use it to make a mangrove to store carbon, that's, that's not, that doesn't fulfil the, the the requirements of conservation. It's just you might as well just go and plant twenty thousand hectares of eucalyptus and leave it there for twenty years, <laughs> which which doesn't support very much biodiversity at all. However, if you can restore ecosystems from a biodiversity perspective as well as from a carbon perspective as well as from you know that that will actually provide uh those that's it i, I do a lot of work with ecosystem services that same level uh of ecosystem service provision to the local people including flood attenuation wave attenuation supporting the uh, the kind of uh the aquaculture side from a uh from a kind of a, a more kind of subsistence use whether it's collecting crabs or collecting kind of fish from that area as well as those that kind of export into other adjacent ecosystems then you're actually you're kind of really protecting nature but you're 
you're doing it for selfish reasons, but it doesn't matter because you're protecting it for a wide range of ecosystem services. So I think that that's a, that's a bonus. So biodiversity credits, yeah, if they do what they're meant to do, it's great. If if it means let's our mangroves really good, so hang on, let's just clear this heshinga, we <laughs> clear this other area, we plant a load of mangroves there. That's not very good. That's that that kind of that goes against the, the 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 grain of the thought. I think. Yeah, it, that's very, 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 very important. We are now writing a paper in which we talk about the biodiversity credits and put some questions about it that are very, you know, uh, some of them I will just put three here on the table because I think it's very important also for the coastal development and coastal impacts. The first is basically to do not take this kind of biodiversity credits as a compensation again. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, if you want to restore the functioning of, of the ecosystem, which is very difficult because we still don't have all the tools to understand the ecosystem functioning, that is the truth. Uh, we lack information about many things, even some things that are extremely simple, like life cycles of the organism or uh, how they, they, which is the trophic interactions, blah, blah, blah. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we, we make this kind of uh, screening of papers and we found 1,000 papers and gray literature that was talking about biodiversity credits. And I was very impressed at the beginning. And I say, okay, that's, that's good. And then you see the screening, only 700 papers really talk about something biodiversity credits, but only seven, only seven papers gave a definition of what they think were the biodiversity credits. And if you go to the United Nations or you go to uh, other kind of uh, uh, companies, which are, if you see carefully, they still don't know nor how to calculate or how to just make anything related with the functioning of this kind of credits. And, and if this is the third point. Okay, okay, okay. We do have this biodiversity credits. I will bet for ecosystem biodiversity credits if it's transparent, if it's uh, really deep, if, if you can regenerate, if you can conserve, blah, blah, blah. But how do we calculate comparing ecosystems? Imagine that you are an enterprise and you want to invest in this kind of carbon uh, of biodiversity credits. You say, no, 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 no. I will give you money to regenerate, for example, or conserve the North Sea. The North Sea is very poor in terms of biodiversity and functioning. It's much more simpler than, for example, the coral reef in the tropical area, in the Caribbean Sea, for example. I mean, it's very complicated, even if you have, because we have the tools, indexes, and we have uh, uh, ways of quantification, and so on, and to verify, to verify the information. How we can just put a number that gives you the possibility to compare systems that are functioning in a very different way. So this can, these three things and other are in this paper that we are working with, trying to really understand what we intend about biodiversity credits and how we can indeed make this much transparent and much direct and much useful, useful for, for the, for the, for the next, uh, 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 you know, for the next uh, uh, generations. É uma, acho que uma coisa importante nessa nessa linha, Sérgio, é que é, nós estamos falando aqui, quando a gente fala disso, nós falamos, nós falamos de, de dar, botar um preço, isso, né? Então, é isso que nós estamos falando. Nós estamos falando de botar um preço no carbono, nós estamos falando de botar um preço na biodiversidade. Né? Assim, colocar um preço nisso é um, significa você ter um mercado para isso, que já arranha né, o ouvido, assim, já é uma coisa que já não é muito... Mas faz sentido, faz sentido, do ponto de vista da, da inibição, né, das equiparações globais e tal, mas localmente, às vezes, não faz tanto sentido assim. Por quê? Porque esses mercados, eles, eles estão longe, ele, isso, isso parte do pressuposto de que esses mercados seriam muito próximos da concorrência perfeita, como é, por exemplo, o mercado de ações, dentro do, e, e nem são também, né, assim... Então, assim, é, que, não, que não há assimetrias muito grandes. Né? Então, esse é um tipo de mercado que existem muitas assimetrias. Né? Quem compra tem informações muito mais privilegiadas, tem acesso a, a outros mercados. Quem vende, principalmente nessa área de, de comunidades, que é a lógica que o Raymond falou que tem problema, realmente tem, né? você não tem um mercado tão bem claramente estabelecido para quem está ofertando. É como se fosse 
É como se você saísse de casa com alguma coisa para vender, você não tem noção nenhuma do que, é que o seu concorrente está vendendo, por quanto, e se, se, e se alguém quer comprar aquilo que você está vendendo. É uma coisa meio assim, num um nível muito abstrato, né? Os preços precisam ter níveis de comparabilidade, como o Sérgio acabou de falar, e você não constrói mercados minimamente eficientes, é isso que precisa para que esse preço seja correto ou mais correto possível, que todas as, as né, os demandantes e ofertantes cheguem a uma, a uma, a uma conta justa para o planeta, digamos assim, ou para eles, né, sei lá, é preciso que tenha menos assimetria, é preciso que tenha, né, essa, que funcione de uma forma menos, com menos atrito. E está muito longe disso, está de, muito longe, eu, eu acho que que talvez a gente não consiga chegar nem próximo do que seria algo desejável. Então, é, é, esse é um modelo, na minha cabeça, temporário, que serve para duas coisas, para impedir um, um avanço desenfreado e para reduzir a culpabilidade de, algum, de algumas regiões e setores. Mas, é, efetivamente, esse não, é, não, na minha, não me parece o, o resultado... Que eu, Digamos que é a melhor inovação que a economia poderia dar, a finança poderia dar para a conservação da vida no planeta. Está muito longe de ser essa, né? na, minha, na minha opinião. Mas, enfim, vamos, vamos ver os próximos capítulos. Uau! É interessante que o Sérgio mencionou a parte funcionária. O Alex está liderando um paper que eu e o Druji e estamos trabalhando na looking at functional groups and uh, how they're likely to respond to, 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 to climate change and how that's likely to be different between uh, kind of Brazil and oh, it's kind of South and North America uh, and West Africa compared to kind of East Africa and uh, and Asia and the, uh, the, the Western Pacific. And and that's important when, you, when you're kind of thinking about biodiversity credits, well, what you just counting the number of species or are you counting the actual function that they perform you know that that's that's something that's really important because that actually influences the ecological functioning and that influence has a knock-on effect on the ecosystem services as well so that's for the things that we you know that we genuinely kind of or, or the, the broad uh group of people in the world actually care about the things that, that influence themselves I think that uh, uh, we need to discuss uh, more, uh, uh, I think in Brazil, all, all over the, the world, the, 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 we call the developmentalist framework. So it's not more place in the planet to, to grow, to economically grow. Uh, all the, the world, mainly the rich countries need to the growth, economically the growth. But I think that uh, it's lacking in Brazil uh, a discussion about uh, uh, the, the economic growth, the developmentalist framework, about uh, the necessity to not development, to, to a growth to the countries. Uh, I think that it's, it's place for a discussion in that because all the the politicians always talk about to develop, to develop, to develop the economical development, and there are no more place to economical development, mainly to the north and all over the world. The the global south countries are paying the bill that they did not generate. Uh, uh, then I think it's important to discuss about development. The necessity, necessity to no development, to the growth of the countries, and uh, it's a, a very good uh, thing for another discussion, for another round of discussions. I think that you are right, Alex, and uh, in some way, I think that most of the people, not all the people, but most of the we are, even if you are, uh, if you bad for the growth or bad for another kind of model, economic model, or you don't bet and you, you see that there is infinite growth and so on, we are all scared because we understood even the people, and this, believe me, that is like that. Even the people that is in the top of the money, they understood that things are rapidly changing for many reasons, not only climate change, guys, for many reasons. Climate change is one of the worst. Biodiversity loss is also one of the worst. Uh, but also other kind of things that are rapidly changing because, well, there are many 
of the non-renewable resources that are just disappearing that we don't have. And then we are focusing on the deep sea mining, or we are focusing even to go to the moon, to the to the uh, uh, moon, sorry, to go to the moon and extract there the minerals that we need for our mobiles, phones. But some some things like there is this, you know. I don't know what will happen, but it, truly we do. I mean, where we lost the way in some way, but but all of us talk about it in one way or the other, and that we try to or to adapt or to reverse or to make a revolution or whatever. But all we are scared because it's animals that we are. We found this kind of living extremely comfortable in some ways for for many people, not for all the people, of course. But we have this kind of sensation, and it's true that the sensation is, is like that, that we have less hungry is truth, more education is truth, more facilities and more infrastructure is truth, but this has had an economic and especially an energetic material cost that now we are paying. And then changing is is caring in some way. I think, indeed, I think so. But I don't know what will happen if we have to, to, to how can I say, if we have to wait, I think we don't have to wait, but the people is just waiting and waiting until we will have any other option than adapt in this kind of the growth or whatever. Yeah. I don't know if uh, the other panelists have something to add, also Alex, <laughs> Alex uh, but I think that it was a, a great discussion. Uh, many Sinuka Jibiku, <laughs> many, I don't know, that, it's not a dead end, but it's, for now, it, it is still is, that we still have some dead ends, right? Um, at least we cannot see the 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 the, the way out at some points. But I really like to thank you to Dr. Samuel, Dr. Sergio, Dr. Raymond. I would like to thank you also the audience that is still with us here in Brazil. It's a three thirty p.m., but in some places of the world, yeah, our partners in Portugal. <laughs> Are already in the, in the, in the, in the at the night. So, so thank, thank you, you again, Katarina and Moutinho. Uh, we will end our session for this day, and we we invite you all to our tomorrow session that we we will start at at eight thirty, okay, in the morning, uh, Brazil time, okay. So thank you very much and see you tomorrow, right? <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao, todo mundo.